Am I the asshole for outing my wife's asexuality after she just let her friends gang up on me? A little backstory. Been together nine years, married for a little over three. We both had incredibly high sex drives in the beginning, and like normal, after some time, they began to come and go. We used to never go more than a few days without having sex. We got married just before the pandemic, which might have added to things. But the long and short of it is that after some personal therapy at the beginning of 2020, my wife concluded that she was asexual and mostly had sex for my benefit and to maintain the relationship. Looking back, I can kind of see it now. It would have been nice to know beforehand, but it is what it is. She still offers sex once in a while because she knows I want to have it, but I turn it down every time. It's no fun having sex with someone who's just doing it for your benefit. If I'm going to have sex with someone, they should actually want to have sex with me, not just for maintenance. Fast forward to this Friday. We went to a party at one of her friend's houses. I know a few people, so it's never too bad, although I'm not a big party guy. As usual, we end up being one of the last to leave. The last hour or so of these parties are usually chill, just sit around in the living room, catch up, and chat. It's quiet, but the conversations eventually turn sexual and personal, and I hate it, honestly, for obvious reasons, namely having to hear all these women talk about how much they love having sex with their husband and partners, and all the things they do, and knowing that I'll never have that. The worst part, though, is that my wife makes up all these wild stories and things we do that we did not in the past. Just flat out lies because she's embarrassed of her asexuality. I just kind of nod along since she's not really comfortable with other people knowing. I had come back from the bathroom to them having a conversation about oral sex. One story about how someone didn't like it at first and now they love it. Another about wishing they got it more. Another about liking it more than sex sometimes. Then it comes time for my wife to talk and they're crying for details. For whatever reason, my wife decides to tell the truth and says that she can't remember the last time someone went down on her. Of course, she left out the key bit of context, which turned into the group arranging how I need to put in more effort, how my wife probably gives me head all the time and I don't return the favor, and how it's so typical of men to be selfish lovers. I took it for a few minutes, hoping my wife would jump in and stop it. She just kept quietly saying, it's okay, it's okay, I don't mind. He does other stuff, blah blah blah, but they kept going. Finally, one of her friends who has an anecdote I effing despise, she's overly confrontational for absolutely no reason, demands to know why I don't eat my wife out more often in a room full of like nine other people. I look to my wife and ask if she'd like to chime in, but she doesn't. I shrug and say that I actually really enjoy performing oral sex on women, but that my wife doesn't let me because we don't have sex. My wife's face dropped as she shot a look at me. I didn't even explicitly say she was asexual, I just said we didn't have sex and haven't for a few years. When further harassed about it, she immediately begins apologizing for me, explaining that things have been rocky, so we haven't been having much sex, which I immediately shut down, because that's not even remotely true. If anything, things have been great lately. If she's been having issues or doubts, this would be my first time hearing them. I finally gave up. I told my wife I was going home, but she said she wasn't done yet or ready to leave. I logged into Uber on her phone so she can use my account and told her she can take it home or stay the night but that I would not sit here and be a punching bag because she was too ashamed to admit that she was asexual. My wife immediately ran to the bathroom and I was told to leave. She came home not long after me and hasn't spoke to me much since except to half-heartedly apologize but that outing her like I did was worse. I apologized for outing her but that she didn't leave me much of a choice. A few of her friends have messaged me calling me every name up and down the book and saying they're going to convince her to leave me. One or two of their boyfriends and husbands messaged me and said they were sorry and didn't know and offered to buy me a beer if I wanted. Another of the friends in an openly poly relationship actually offered to have sex with me, which I showed my wife immediately. She says she knows it must have been shitty to sit there and take it, but they're not really my friends, so some momentary discomfort from people I don't really associate with isn't comparable to her prolonged discomfort of significant people in her life now knowing she's asexual. I completely disagree, but can kind of see where she's coming from. 
So, am I the asshole here? Edit, there's a few things that I can't reply to because there's so many comments and I can't reply to all of them. So one, I actually don't mind not having sex because I genuinely love her. There are times that it does get to me, and this was admittedly one of them, but they are very rare. Maybe two or three times a year. No part of me believes that she bait-switched me for a ring. That's just not who she is. Two, she is asexual. She's not effing other guys. I'm not some cuck waiting at home like a few DMs insinuated. I went with her for a few therapy sessions where she let me know. I fully support her. 3. Yes, I'm aware that technically it is my fault we don't have sex. Asexuality is a spectrum. Yes, she feels no desire to have sex. She physically likes sex, but otherwise she could live without it. My boundary is I don't want to have sex with someone who doesn't desire me. I'm not undermining asexuality by having that boundary. 4. The issue here isn't that I'm with someone who is asexual. I'm not sure why people keep telling me that my marriage is over. I never suggested it. The issue is how she handles it and expects me to take the brunt of this kind of bullshit because she is ashamed of it. In the comments, Coffee Soup says, There was an easy solution to this that she could have taken forever ago. Don't talk about your sex life. Make it clear that as your partner, she doesn't feel comfortable talking about what you both do in the bedroom. That keeps her desire to hide her sexuality intact, while also not screwing you over with lies. Not the asshole. She just threw you under the bus in every way to save face with her friends, instead of doing the small things to keep things she wanted private, private. I get that everybody has different levels of comfort and different forms of friendship, but this has always been a pretty hard line for me. I don't talk about what I get down to in the bedroom, and my wife doesn't either. It's nobody's business but our own since we are monogamous. If it comes up in conversation around the few friends who might talk about that type of stuff, all I say is that I'm happy with our sex life, because that's the truth and the extent of what I feel comfortable sharing. It's hilarious to me that wifey didn't realize this and just shut the hell up. Not only that, but she knew she was lying heaps, but it never occurred to her that her friends might be doing the same, and if they continually bag on their husbands, that eventually it'll bite them in the ass. I don't really understand why anyone bothers opening their mouth with this information ever. You're pretty much guaranteed to walk into a trap at some point. Not the asshole. She was willing to let you take the hit that she wasn't, not because it was less, but just less her problem. She outright lies to her friends to look good, but when it's you, oh well, better only to tell a half-truth. I wouldn't be remotely remorseful. She is way out of line. That's the most effed up part. She wasn't caught off guard by the conversation going to oral. The conversation was already on personal sex lives. She was already lying for her own sake, then suddenly we can't continue to lie and talk OP up. Unforgivable. She literally said they aren't your friends, so why should you sit there and take a bunch of shit from people who aren't your friends? What the hell? In what world do you let strangers talk shit about you and not defend yourself? Sorry, but she's just pissed that you make her look like the asshole liar she is. She could have stopped it at any time, but chose not to. She has no one to blame but herself for the fallout that happened. You are under no obligation to have strangers, not friends, sit there and talk shit about you and just accept it. Update. TLDR of the original post, though, was during therapy, wife came to accept that she was asexual, didn't want to tell anyone out of embarrassment, made up sex stories about us, and let her friends chew me out during a party, instead of telling them off because of embarrassment of being ace. And I outed her when I said I was sick of being a punch bag because she was ashamed of her asexuality. In the time since, I did apologize for outing her, and she apologized to me for letting it get that far. She ended up telling all her friends, and none of them cared and were entirely supportive. She asked them to apologize to me because it was her who put me in that situation, but only one of them has, and it was a half-hearted one at that. Paraphrasing, but basically, yeah, sorry, but maybe it's best if you don't come to gatherings anymore sort of thing. We've started back at couples counseling too. I was happy with where things ended up after the initial conversation, but we decided to go back to get everything out and hopefully find a workable way forward. A few things I wanted to address from comments everywhere. Asexuality is real. 
She's not low libido, she has no libido, and doesn't feel that urge everyone else does. She believes that she never has, but talked herself into thinking it because that's what she felt she was supposed to do. I wasn't paraphrasing, misunderstanding, or putting words into her mouth. This is her description of it. A handful of people said that it was entirely my fault for us not having sex, and my boundary was harmful to asexual people and childish. So I wanted to clarify. My wife was the one who used the phrasing of maintenance sex. She has made it clear that she has no desire for sex, but will do it for me occasionally if I want it. In her words, it's a task she's happy to do to keep me happy, and I'm not comfortable with that. It's more or less a favor, like if I asked her to pick up my dry cleaning. It's not selfish or childish to want a partner to actually want to have sex with you. Otherwise, it's masturbating with someone's body, which I'm not fine with. I'm fine without sex. That part was grossly overinflated in some comments. I was uncomfortable at the lying and being thrown under the bus. I value her far more than sex anyway. There's more that defines a relationship than sex. Many people pointed out how it was weird friends sit around and talk about their sex lives. I believe so to some degree. These aren't super raunchy conversations anyway, but I see no issue in close friends being open about things like this. It's not a big deal to me personally. In her defense, without me asking, since I wouldn't be comfortable telling her who and who not to be friends with, she has turned down a couple of invites to go out since, and has removed the two main instigators from social media, which is enough for me. Some people were confused on the ages too. Everyone's late 20s to mid 30s. I'm not going to divorce her, so you can stop wasting time suggesting that. So yeah, boring update, I know, but everything is fine. In the comments, Bayest Theorem says, This is not a good update at all. Your wife doesn't appear to believe that she's done anything wrong here, other than letting the conversation get that far. She literally lied to her friends to try to shit talk you and make you look like a bad spouse, but apparently doesn't see that as being a big issue. Honestly, I question what you actually get out of this relationship. You're not having good sex, so there's no physical connection. She appears to be fine with shit-talking you openly with no regrets, so there's no emotional connection. Are you staying with this woman simply because you're afraid to be alone? He was told to stay away, even after the wife clarified she lied to her friends? I feel so sorry for this guy. He seems really sweet and supporting of his wife and her identity, but her actions still seem cruel throughout the updates. Having to be dragged back to therapy by him, the victim of her lies, letting the friends continue shutting him because of her lies, asking for her friends to apologize, and then never following up seems like she's happy to keep her friend life and home life separate. Perfect conditions for the lying to continue. Yeah, so this won't fizzle out, right? Feels like a whole lot of rug sweeping and the wife's shitty friends are only going to make it worse. It'll come back, probably worse, this is why sex lives are supposed to be private. I honestly don't know any adults who discuss their sex lives to this extent, especially not in a group setting. It's weird. Maybe when we were teenagers and it was a novelty, but now it's just like, okay, you have sex. Congratulations. It just seems so wild to me that someone in their mid-20s to early 30s would be so embarrassed to tell their apparently close friends that they're ace. Like, if these people are your friends, it shouldn't matter, and it sounds like when she did tell them, they didn't care. I think it's a major red flag that the wife would rather have lied to her friends about her husband being selfish in the bedroom than to come out as ace. Yeah, don't know about that one. That's a uh, whole kettle of fish that I'm glad I'm not a part of personally. And to be fair to OP, he did give her time to recognize how much they were shit-talking him and for her to step in and right her wrongs, but she never did. It didn't even seem like he fixed that in the update here. It seems like they're just like, you know what, let's just pretend this never happened. We'll say our sorries for it, but I'm going to still be friends with these people and uh, not really fix my attitude and the issue that arose here. <laughs> I don't know, if he's happy to be with her without sex, then more power to him, but I do wonder if he's eventually going to end up on the r slash dead bedroom subreddits, because like, he's obviously someone that enjoys sex a lot, and I feel like there's only so much time you can go without it, and without that physical connection with your partner, that resentment for said partner will start bubbling up over time, whether you want it to or not. I feel like it's just, 
innate human nature that you not having that physical contact and that connection, that'll slowly cause a divide, surely. Our next post is one that I saw on Twitter recently. The OP has since deleted their account. But my god, what a story. Titled, Am I the asshole for believing my daughter over a grown man? So I don't know if I watch too many crime shows or if I'm just paranoid. So I've come here to ask. Last week, I made chicken gnocchi soup. When it was almost done, I started helping my daughter with a school project. She got us both a bowl, and a few seconds later, my boyfriend runs into the room with a bowl and tells me to eat from the bowl that he has. I told him it was all the same, and he insisted that he wanted mine because it had more chicken. Thinking back now, I don't know how he would know that considering my daughter dished it out. My daughter took the bowl that he gave me and said that she would eat it. He yanked it out of her hand and said, No, it's for mum. I took the bowl, and he went to the living room. I continued doing my daughter's project and told her not to eat the soup. Twenty-ish minutes later, I walked into the kitchen to pour the soup out and he was still eating his. He asked why we didn't eat any and I said the cat got into it while we were waiting for it to cool down. He screamed, What? Was it your bowl? Cats can't eat that! I told him that it was only a lick, but he's been stressed out watching the cat like a hawk. Obsessive even. His reaction was very weird. These accidents all happened before the soup incident over a span of six months. It wasn't one after another in a short period of time. Since then, my emergency money has gone missing. I keep money hidden just in case. I lost my older sister because she wasn't able to escape a dangerous situation, and I literally swore on my grave that I would never be in that position. After the soup incident, I went to get my money and it was gone. It was hidden, and I changed the location every few months. I asked my daughter if maybe she found it, and that if she took it, I wouldn't be mad because I knew she couldn't have spent it. She said no. A few hours later, she tells me she forgot, but the other day her and my boyfriend got pulled over, and she saw my pink wallet in his glove box. I didn't tell her which wallet it was in, or that it was in a wallet. I decided to ask him if he found it by accident, and he asked me why I was hiding a large amount of money. You know you could never leave me. (laughs) He has never said anything like that before. I told him it was for my daughter's Christmas. He said no, he didn't find the money, but could use his credit card for gifts. I didn't tell him about my daughter seeing my wallet in his car. Now here are a few other things that have happened in the past few months that seemed random at the time, but now they don't. I have a severe allergy to latex, One day we were about to have sex, and I glanced at the mirror that we have by our bed and saw the condom wrapper was a different color. I stopped him because it wasn't latex-free, and he said that it was a mistake and just an older one that he had. We've been dating for over two years, and he knows how serious my allergy is. My EpiPen that I keep in my room is missing, and I didn't realize it. I didn't realize it was missing until I was searching for my money. Another odd thing is one day he was following me down the stairs while I was carrying my laundry, and he kicked the back of my leg and I fell. He said he slipped, but the stairs are wood, and he was wearing his steel toe boots. At the time, I thought it was an accident. Am I overthinking this? My anxiety has been at an all-time high. Do I watch too much true crime? Here is why I think I might be the asshole. We have a good relationship. He loves my daughter like she is his, we split all shared bills, and we both pull our own weight around the apartment. We don't fight. He has never so much as raised his voice at me. We are paycheck to paycheck, but bills are paid. I thought about going to my mum's house for a few days and asking him when I get there what I'm safe about the money, but I don't have the money to do that now. She's on a fixed income and she can't help. I feel stupid for being scared. Last night, I decided to check his car for my wallet, and he caught me. I asked him for my money back, and he tried playing dumb. I told him my daughter saw it there. He told me she was lying. I told him I never told her about the money or what wallet. He said he was a grown man, and kids lie all the time. I asked him once more for my money, and he said, I'm not giving you money to leave me! I waited until he was in the shower to grab my cat and daughter, and we left. 
I can't take my cat with us to a shelter, and the DV shelters are full. I was able to get us a night at a cheap motel. This exact situation is why I had money saved. I did everything right, and now I'm screwed. I just feel like I blew up my entire life. Yes, I'm using a burn account and reading all the comments that I can. And yep, there is updates to this. Um, she has her daughter and their cat, they are safe, and they're away from this guy. She has since deleted her accounts, and that's really all we have in that situation. It kind of seems like he's trying to kill her. <laughs> it is a real post. This is real. This is very much real. I have, I have uh, researched it. It is insane. My heart goes out to you, OP. I'm glad that you, your daughter, and your cat are safe. I do hope that you're able to get away from this guy and get the help that you need because, oh my god, that is terrifying. Am I the asshole for excluding my adopted sister from family photos? I am 26 female, and my adopted sister Ali is 14. The way we are quote-unquote related is that my younger brother Michael, 24 male, has been with his wife Maya, 24 female, since their freshman year of high school. Maya and Ali had a really bad home life, and my mom is very much a my home is open to everyone type of person. So over that year, Maya began spending more and more time at our house, eventually bringing Ali over as well since she was always babysitting. By the time Michael and Maya were 16 years old, Maya basically lived in the guest room and Ali spent after school, most weekends, holidays and summer vacation at our house. My mom and dad said that they both love Maya and Ali like their own children. My other siblings, 18 male and 16 female, also treat her like she's a part of the family. Even after Maya and Michael moved out, Ali is still at their house the same amount, if not more than she was before. Now to preface, I have nothing against Ali. She's a good kid, and I make an effort to be nice to her. However, I've never really liked how she was foisted into our lives. She's not actually adopted, and she still has parents and her own family. Yet my parents spend so much time and resources on her, it's ridiculous. Everyone else has started unironically calling her their daughter or sister, and I've just refused. I don't consider her to be family. Anyways... I got married recently, which is where the issues start. I invited Ali to the wedding, of course, and she came with all of my other family. When we were doing pictures of the wedding parties, I decided that I wanted one with all of my immediate family, so my parents, my siblings, and Maya, and Maya and Michael's daughter. My mom brought Ali up to come take the picture with us, and I was forced to tell her no. My mom started to get upset, but then Ali said that it was okay and sat down by herself. My mom isn't a very confrontational person, so she didn't make a very big deal of it, but then everyone else realized that Ali wasn't there, and they got mad as well. Ultimately, we took the photo how I wanted it because they didn't want to do this at the wedding, but my entire family is pissed at me now. My mom said that Ali cried when she got home because I don't love her, which I don't. I feel like they forced me into a position where I had to do an asshole thing by forcing this kid onto me. I don't think I should have to consider her family if I don't want to. Am I the asshole? Edit. After the ceremony, but before the reception, the wedding party and both of our close families took photos. I did not include Ali in this photo session, and she sat with the rest of the regular guests waiting for dinner. I did not intentionally exclude her from any of the photos taken. I'm sure she's in some of them from throughout the night, especially because she was there with my family. I hope that clears some things up. In the comments, Meltony says, Not the asshole off of what she described, but I guess I'm just curious about how bad things are at her biological family's house. Does she have no relationship with them at all? Does she stay there partially and have a room over there? If she does, I feel like that really cements the not the asshole. But either way, I feel like you're pretty justified, and being almost like family or close to your family doesn't actually make her family. She is family in the sense that she's your sister-in-law's sister, and you share a niece and nephew, but yeah, no, that to me is not a sibling's relationship. As much as they love her, that doesn't make her immediate family. I'd probably feel the same way about her as a distant cousin. OP replies, Her father went to prison a couple of years ago, and her mom is bipolar. She has a room at her mom's house and stays there on some school nights because her mom goes batshit if she's gone for too long. 
I know she doesn't like to be at her own house, but it's not like she's being beaten. I guess that's also part of the reason that I didn't appreciate Ali's presence in our lives, because it invited her mother's presence as well, and she is deeply unpleasant to be around. Info. Did you do another photo with everyone included? OP says, No, I just wanted a family photo, and to me, Ali isn't family. She was just another guest. Damn, you made a scene at your own wedding in front of other guests, and now your entire family is angry, and you still don't see the problem with your self-absorbed behavior? What does the groom think of all of this? Update. The people who are agreeing with me are starting to convince me that I'm wrong. To the people calling my parents nasty things in my PMs, or just saying that they aren't good people, you're dead wrong. My mom is the most caring and kind-hearted woman in the world, and I should have made that more clear in my post. To be clear, I am also not a monster. I don't mistreat Ali. I get her birthday and Christmas presents every year. However, I am starting to understand that I did do a shitty thing by publicly excluding her at my wedding because I wanted it to be how exactly I imagined, especially because my mom was apparently blindsided by my feelings. I was 16 to 18 when Ali started coming around a lot, and I didn't form the same bond that everyone else did. I never super liked being around kids, including my sister, who by all accounts behaved way worse than Ali ever did. But I recognize that she's become a part of our family, and I think I'm going to make more of an effort to get to know her properly, because I do know she is very mature and intelligent for her age. Also, I don't mean to minimize what Maya and Ali have gone through. By saying she wasn't physically abused, I'm also meant to explain why she hadn't been legally removed from her mother's house. She does have extended family that actually cares about her, but they live a minimum an hour away, so she stays with my parents the majority of the time. Thank you for all of your input. In the comments, Confident Test 7948 says, Sounds like you might have seen the light, but that was the most heartless thing I've heard of in a long time. The two girls are lucky enough to find a loving home and become a part of a family, and then, just kidding, you really aren't a part of the family. It's the you aren't wanted all over again. You need to look in the mirror and see if you like that person. You're the asshole, but I see that you've already begun to change your thought process. Congrats, family isn't always blood. In some ways I can get OP's perspective. How many times have we seen parents try and force a bond between stepkids, and am I the asshole usually sides with the kid that resents the bonding? This is similar in that it's an outside person being brought in. At the same instance, I feel for Ali, to whom this must have felt out of left field, since OP is usually okay with having them around. I'm kinda mad at the parents for not checking in with all the kids to see if they're okay with Ali becoming family, and they should have noticed OP never calling her that. I feel like this is special circumstances, because it wasn't an actual adoption, it was about helping out a kid with a tough family life, who was already sort of attached to their own family by virtue of her sister marrying into it, so I get why they didn't ask their kids before helping. Now, as for them seeing her as a part of the family, that's trickier, and in my opinion, should not be forced. Sucks for Ali, but I don't really see how she's the asshole here. Seems like she never really bonded with Ali, and their parents also did nothing to bridge the gap when they decided to take her in, all without asking for their actual kids' opinions. Yeah, I really don't get this one. Yes, family doesn't have to be blood, but that doesn't mean that OP needs to view Ali as family. What happened was shitty, but what exactly was supposed to happen? Someone in the comments section recommended just taking the photos with her and then crop Ali out, but isn't that just as messed up? I feel for Ali. I guarantee that was a horrible moment for her. You can't make someone love you though. You cannot be the asshole for not loving someone who you really don't see a lot anyway. I can see why she was voted you're the asshole. She should have just sucked it up or taken another photo with her, but I think saying she's the asshole because she doesn't love Ali is weird. There isn't really a character arc for OP to have in this scenario other than that she should learn to lie and save face, I guess. Unexposed is by user Ayadeyadeyadewa, titled... I'm finding out my girlfriend of one year is deaf as I'm on the bus on my way to see her for the first time. Holy shit, I'm trembling. Still six hours until I make it. I need to let this out somewhere. 
I, female 20, met her, female 21, in a match of League of Legends two years ago. We talked a lot, became really close, and basically started dating one year ago. We send each other pictures all the time and videos as well, so I never really understood her apprehension to FaceTime me. We tell each other everything. I mean everything. She's presented me her parents, and I know all her family. Today I was going to surprise her by visiting for the first time. I talked with her sister to make sure it was okay. Less than 30 minutes ago I get a text from her, and I'm copying a translated version here that says, Hey love, you are so sweet and beautiful, and you deserve so much better. I know you're coming because S told me. I'm sorry to ruin your surprise, it's just I'd hate to see your face when you find out. I know we promise to always be truthful, but I've been lying to you all this time. That was her first paragraph, and I was shitting myself because I thought she was breaking up with me, but then she continued. You were too caring to ask why I never speak, why I never sent you a voice note. You're just too perfect, and there is no way that you'd be with me if you knew. The reason is very simple. I was born deaf. I'm sorry that you have to find out this way. I'm just a coward for not telling you sooner. I'll understand if you don't want to be with me anymore. Holy fuck. I was expecting something totally different, and now I'm scared because I've never interacted with a deaf person, and I want to make sure that she gets that I love her either way. I'm still in disbelief that she thought that it'd be a deal breaker for me. I'm scared and need to let it all out. Sorry for the long text. In the comments, Ooh Kasparu says, Well that's literally the absolute perfect opportunity to learn sign language. It's a skill that you'll acquire and it can always come in handy. One of my good bros in high school was deaf, and what I can say is that you'll be just fine. My friend had other deaf friends, and they were a fun and hilarious bunch of people. They played music so freaking loud at parties that it would shake the whole house. Good luck, OP. Update. Holy shit. That's how I would describe my whole experience. I'm back in my house now, and I'm still processing everything that happened. I texted her that I was outside and my hands were shaking. I had no idea what to do. I asked her if she can lip read and she said very little. When she opened the door, her eyes were already wet and when she saw me, she broke down crying and I started crying as well. I stopped thinking and just hugged her. I started speaking soothing words until I realized it was useless. After we both calmed down, we went to her room and started typing in our cell phones to talk to each other. At the beginning it was kind of awkward, but after a while it was pretty chill. We cuddled a lot, watched a lot of movies, and kissed a lot. It was a really beautiful day. Then there were some screw-ups from my side. Out of the blue I'd start speaking to her until I saw her confused face. I called her by her name when I was searching from her and tried to show her funny TikToks. The funny part being the audio, <laughs> yeah, I'm stupid I know. But overall it was an amazing day. She is more perfect than I could ever imagine. Thank you for all the words of support in the post. I appreciate you guys. Edit, thank you so much for the kind words. When I posted it, I never expected to get so many comments. I'm grateful for all of your suggestions and tips, but maybe it's important to mention that we speak Spanish, and as far as I understand, ASL is not the same in Spanish, so I have a lot of work to do. Have a great night. In the comments, Warm Apple Pies says, You've been dating for a year and she never mentioned that? Seems they've been long distance, which, I mean, makes sense. But also, like, a year and no FaceTiming? I'd be more concerned I was getting catfished, Lamal. I'd be fine with a random catfish. I'd be more scared that it's some serial killer using social media to lure me in. If a wannabe serial killer was using social media to search for victims, they'd almost certainly get caught before they kill enough people to be labelled as a serial killer. Update 2 I know nobody cares, but I still need to vent. It's been almost three weeks since we met up IRL. She stayed over last weekend at my place and we had a great time. But every time I wanted to say something and couldn't and had to type it, I felt frustration and anger. Because just now it's hitting me that she could have told me, just like y'all said, and I'd already know at least a little bit of sign. It angers me because she knows how I am. She knows me better than anyone, and she still thought that I wouldn't love her. 
I know it's more of a me issue, but still I can't help feeling sad. I don't want this to ruin our relationship, and I know I have to talk to her, but I guess I'm not ready yet. Edit, thank you for your words of encouragement and support. I appreciate them. I read all of your comments, but there are too many, and I'd be here all day long replying to them. For those of you that say that it was never real because we never even saw each other, are wrong. I never said we didn't send each other pictures or videos. She sent me a lot of videos of her doing stuff, but just never speaking. I did the same, but I spoke a lot in my videos because I didn't know. So yeah, call our relationship fake all you want, only we know what we have. In the comments, Hey, so I discovered I'm upset that you kept this from me, and a little insulted. I don't want to break up, or maybe you do, I don't know, but I do want to address this. I've told you so much about me. You know me better than basically everyone in my life, but you didn't tell me. It feels like you lied to me for months. I'm having trouble with those feelings. It wouldn't have been a deal breaker for me. I know you probably have had issues with this before, so I'm trying not to be judgmental. I know you didn't do this to be mean, but it still hurts. If I had known, I could have started to learn sign language already so we could talk in person rather than through our phones in text. I'm upset that I didn't get the choice to continue. I still like you, but this is where I am. Send that message and then discuss where you both go from here. And OP replies, Wow, thank you so much. You expressed how I feel better than I could have ever put into words. It's not really my strong suit. I'll use it as a guide. Thank you so much. Remember, choice of words means a lot and can be taken a few different ways. Like the ending of the message above. If you have said you loved her in the past and now end it with, I still like you, that is a huge difference than, I love you, I will continue to love you, this is how I feel and I believe that we can work through this. To me, the I still like you basically is signaling an ending of the relationship, but the second phrasing is showing that she is worth working through a rough patch. Final update. Hey guys, this is my last post because I'm ready to move on, and you helped me a lot, so you deserve to know how it all went. We talked, I wrote what I was feeling and thinking, using a comment as inspiration from an amazing Redditor. Thank you, stranger. She completely understood what I felt and where it came from. She apologized profusely. She has already done that a couple of times and told me that it was okay if I break up with her. We talked for hours about honesty and communication and we both put our cards on the table. In the end, I told her I still love her and she told me the same. We cried, laughed and hugged a lot. It was tough for some moments but I think the worst part is already over. I'm already looking for a sign language classes, and I know the alphabet. I'm sure this whole thing has helped to strengthen our relationship. Thank you to all that commented and gave advice. I appreciate it. Have a great day. In the comments, That's a Stick says, It's interesting that they've been together for a year without her putting together that she'd never heard her speak. I've had text flings in my past that I never heard the person speak, but a year is a long time. It's like the people on Catfish who have been together for years, but haven't once talked on the phone. At a certain point, you have to be at least curious, right? These two were sending videos, so it's not like she ever had any reason to suspect she wasn't who she said she was, but you got to imagine after a certain point, she'd wonder what her voice sounds like. I don't know, man. Digital communication is an interesting part of modern relationships. It's wild, but also they're lesbians, and lesbians do wild shit when dating like this. So to be honest, I'm not surprised. Okay, so this is the moment when I feel too old and old school, because I don't understand modern relationships. No judgments or anything, it's just that half of these things sound very bizarre. How can you communicate with someone to the point that you call each other girlfriends and even go as far as saying the other person knows everything about you, but can go on without having any kind of verbal interaction and then not finding something odd? Well, that's because you can't understand what it's like to be deaf. For us, having no verbal interaction is normal, and you're the one being weird about it, just like she was worried that OP would be. It's not just exclusive to deaf people. This is actually a really common occurrence in the digital age where long-distance friendships and relationships are normalized. 
I've been friends with people for over a decade, and I have zero clue what their voices sound like. Am I the asshole for telling my friend's boyfriend that he shouldn't have been allowed to eat? Some friends and I decided to do the trend where we have a dinner and everybody brings a food that starts with the first letter of their name. There is one friend of ours that's a bit of a moocher. Whenever we go out, she never pays for stuff. Whether it's the dinner bill, tickets for the movies, etc., we always end up paying for her. But everyone accepted this and doesn't really have an issue with it. However, recently, it's become worse. She's been dating this guy for a couple of months, and she brings him everywhere with her, even when he's not invited. So now we have two people to pay for. Also, I feel like I have to say that they have jobs. They're not struggling. It would be different if they were broke, then of course I wouldn't mind. But yeah, we had the dinner last night and everybody brought food and put a lot of effort into it. These two, however, showed up with absolutely nothing. Not even a bottle of soda. We were annoyed, but nobody said anything. It wasn't until the end of the night when they were leaving that I cracked a little. The friend's boyfriend was taking home all the barbecue ribs that were left. I repeat, all of it, and it was a lot. Like, damn, be considerate at least. He emptied the entire tray of ribs into a container. That's when I politely asked, can you maybe not take all of it? The others might want some too. He got all defensive and asked, why are you treating me like I'm stealing all the food? I clarified that I never said such a thing and that I only asked that he didn't take all of it. He got angry, plopped the ribs back and said, fine, I don't need your food. To which I replied, it kind of seems like you do. And to be honest, you shouldn't have eaten at all since you didn't contribute again, as usual. Then my friend came, took him, and just left without saying anything. Now apparently she's angry with us, mainly me. Most of my friend group doesn't think that I did anything wrong, but there are a couple who are saying that I shouldn't have said anything. The thing is that I didn't even say anything to my friend because I don't mind that she doesn't contribute. Her boyfriend was the one that was irritating me. He eats the most food but doesn't contribute, drinks the most alcohol, doesn't contribute, orders really expensive meals at restaurants, doesn't contribute towards the bill. I guess I got kind of annoyed and snapped at him. I tried phoning her to clarify that I don't have any issues with her, but she's ignoring me. I don't know, maybe I should have left well enough alone. In the comments, Tizzery says, Not the asshole, but be honest, you kind of do mind that the friend is a mooch. Also, y'all should have put the brakes on this because you basically trained mooch friend that it was okay to take advantage of y'all. And of course, she thinks it's okay that her mooch boyfriend should be paid for as well and get to take all of the leftovers home. Next time the group gets together, she needs to get told point blank that she needs to pay for her and her boyfriend's share or pull an end run with the server. Pull him or her aside and tell them to not put Moochie Sue and her boyfriend's meal on the group's tab. If they show up to a potluck, do not let them through the door empty-handed. Oh, we are so glad you're here. You didn't bring anything yet. That's fantastic. We've already started drinking, so be a love and run to the store and grab a bag of ice and some Pepsi. That can be your contribution. You teach people how to treat you. If you lay down like a doormat, they will wipe their feet on you. Edit to add, to the couple of friends that think that you were wrong, let them know that since they're okay with the Mooch twins, they can cover the Mooch's share of the bill as you will no longer be subsidizing them. I'd even put forth that they are welcome to pay my bill as well next time. And OP replies, Okay, fine. You caught me. I do mind, and I find it annoying. I put up with it because everyone else says to. Oh my god, don't tell her that. You'll make her feel bad. I wanted to phone her and clarify that I had no problems with her to avoid drama. God, do I hate the drama. By speaking up, I sort of divorced our friend group now, and the whole situation is annoying. Why the hell are you guys enabling her mooching, and now her boyfriend's mooching? Tell her she's not welcome back until she pays back everyone, and her boyfriend is not invited. If he shows up with her, neither will be allowed in. Don't let these people live off you guys. OP replies, Yeah, it's stupid to be honest. She is substantially younger than the rest of us, so when she initially started the not paying thing, everybody was like, Aw, she's young, let's pay for her and she sort of became the little sister of the group. The handful of times I did mention paying, she acts like she forgot. 
For example, we were both in line for snacks and I offered for her to go ahead of me like, do you want to go first? She acted all surprised and was like, oh yeah, I'll go first. Yet I fully know that she expected me to pay for the both of us. Yeah, OP, I don't think you're the asshole in the situation here. I think, as people have said previous to this, you and the group have conditioned her to be okay with this, she understands that, and she's abusing it to the fullest extent. She's even brought her mooching Andy boyfriend into this one as well, and you guys have just continued to let it slide. They're just stealing from you at this point, and you're just watching this shit show happen and being like, no one, no one stop it. I swear to God, if anyone tries to stop it, there's going to be a problem here. I really like it when people uh, rub me blind, and this is really cool and normal. I applaud you for saying it, OP, because someone had to say it, and I'm glad that you spoke up. So not the asshole. They need to cut that shit out. Update. I wanted to clarify the reason I said I don't really have a problem with her not contributing is because I personally never paid for her in terms of dinner, tickets, etc. I've paid for exactly a drink, some popcorn, and parking before, but she obviously still benefits from me and the others when we bring food and drinks and she brings nothing. I've always thought that it was unfair, but nobody wanted to say anything so I left it alone. I should also mention that she's a friend by association. I've only known her since the beginning of this year. I confronted her, like many of you suggested, and started off by saying I thought it was unfair that her boyfriend was taking all the food, and that is why I spoke up. She said she's sorry, and the boyfriend only did that because he didn't think that anyone would mind. I should say that even though she eats at these things, she's never taken copious amounts of food before. I said that I don't speak on behalf of everyone, but I feel it's unfair that she keeps bringing her boyfriend, and also that she never contributes to anything. Since she had just been apologetic, I thought she would respond by saying that she would start to contribute, but instead, she asked why I cared so much because I don't even eat ribs, and that I embarrassed her and her boyfriend for nothing. I don't eat meat, but that was beside the point. My friend put a lot of hours into cooking those ribs just for this guy to take them all? No, it's not right. And I didn't make a scene, he did. I spoke very politely, so I explained that again and said that she's been an inconsiderate friend. She said, I don't know why you're attacking me when nobody else has a problem. Then said that she didn't want to associate with me anymore. I said that was fine and that was the end of it. I told the others the outcome and the friend that introduced Mooch to us was really mad that I caused a rift between everyone over food. So the group essentially split up, and those who were irritated with me will continue to hang out with her. The others who secretly found her annoying but were too polite also spoke up and decided to branch off too. Our mooch-free group hung out a couple of times already, and all the complaints are finally being released. Also, everybody brings something now, which is nice. Not just that, but it's a more relaxing and stress-free environment without them. The introducer friend is trying to poach some of the new group to no avail, which I think is funny, but anyway, that's it. Sorry if this was anticlimactic, and I know this is like juvenile high school stuff, but hey, that's what happened. In the comments, Aggressive Bed says, I mean, the previous thread spelled it out in upvotes. Why are you or anyone tolerating this behavior? Why? I cannot imagine being friends with someone who isn't struggling, but shows up to group events and just orders, consumes, enjoys, and never contributes. I've been in a position where I couldn't afford to do something and have made that clear, and have had friends offer to pay for my portion. I've done the same for my friends many times myself. If there's a monetary issue, and I value someone's company, and it's communicated, then who cares? But to have a person who's perfectly able to pay and just doesn't? That isn't ever happening around me more than once. It is absolutely ridiculous. I showed up to a really rich person's holiday party last year. They know I'm struggling with finances, but I still brought a decent bottle of wine as a thank you, and it wasn't potluck style. Just a holiday party at their house, and that's what you do. You bring anything that shows you thought about them, lol. I love this. I have a friend like this that we distance ourselves from for just being overall shitty. 
One of the girlies got married and was like, oh my god, we kind of have to tell this friend. So the bride invited her to the evening do, and she said maybe. The wedding happened, no word from the friend the whole lead up because this is what she does. So flaky. And when we went back into the reception after dinner, she was just stood there. Like she herself was the wedding gift. Then threatened me if I didn't make her my bridesmaid. I'm the engaged one of the trio. She'd kick me in the tits, proceeded to hang off my neck and tell me she misses me despite ghosting us for years, trapped my fiancé in a corner telling him she was going to show up on my doorstep for a surprise visit, and then drunk cry that again, she misses us. I need to do this with her. What you need is a beefy security guard at your wedding. And yes, you also need to cut her off too. Stacity says, win-win ending, mooch free group and no longer doormats and no longer have to put up with cheapo friend. Mooch group are now feeling the consequences. Poor behavior going unchecked will worsen and because of their pride to avoid acknowledging that it's wrong, they will eat the costs. Also, there are now a lot less people to spread out the mooching, so it will literally cost them more as three people dealing with two freeloaders is going to be a lot worse than ten people who all pretend that it was fine. This is a good outcome, and once again, communication for the win. I think we all saw this update coming, this ending to the story happening, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was more pressure from the group that tried to turn OP uh, away from that decision to cut off the mooching friend. People in group settings are crazy and do not act rationally. It's just so insane to me that once the cat is out of the bag, the mooches are still welcome with these people. Like, what are you people smoking? You were given a get-out-of-jail-free card and you still sit with these leeches, these parasites. Anyway, congratulations, OP, and I still think you're not the asshole. Our next post is by user Throwaway Rat Problem, titled, Am I the asshole for telling my daughter that she should leave her pet rat at home now my girlfriend has moved in? Edit about the title, I mean her mother's home. When I realized a word was missing, I couldn't edit it. So my, male 45, girlfriend, female 45 of two years and I have moved in together. Everything's great and she gets along very well with my children, at least with my son. I share custody of my two children, male 16 and female 15, with my ex-wife, female 40. There is one problem. My girlfriend has a phobia for mice, rats, squirrels. In other words, rodents. This is something we all know, and people laugh about it, but it's a serious issue for my girlfriend who can't even see a picture without starting hyperventilating. My daughter got a rat as a present when she turned 15. She brought it home and my girlfriend freaked out, and she apparently left the apartment without even noticing that she didn't have her shoes or coat on. I got upset with my daughter because she knows my girlfriend's fear. I told her that she should leave her pet at her mother's house from now on when she comes here. My daughter got upset and started yelling that my girlfriend is being ridiculous, and me too. Her rat wasn't the problem, so it shouldn't have to be kept at her mom's, and that my girlfriend should move out since she's the one who has the problem with the rat, not the rat with her. I told her that we're a family, and family makes compromises. Now she's saying that if the rat isn't welcome, then neither is she, and she's now planning to stay with her mom until her rat is allowed, or my girlfriend has moved out. My ex-wife called me to tell me that I'm the asshole for choosing my girlfriend. I told her that she was the asshole for getting my daughter this present. Am I the asshole? My honest opinion is that your ex-wife is a complete piece of shit for starting this. What an awful, terrible human to intentionally do that to you. Your daughter also shares blame for going along with this one, knowing that your girlfriend has a phobia of it. Your daughter is old enough to know better, but unfortunately she's also caught under the influence of your ex-wife, who I said just now is a piece of shit. Both your daughter and your ex-wife are complete assholes in this situation, and you're not the asshole. I, I feel like it's easy to spell this one out. Info. Yeah, well, like many here anticipated, this whole rat thing was planned on purpose, and I have to say that it makes sense, since I never once had the impression that my daughter even liked rats. I was surprised at the birthday party. My girlfriend and I moved in together about three weeks ago, and the rat showed up about ten days ago. I know this now because I've tried to text my daughter about other suggestions like a second rat, a dog, etc. She has made up her mind. 
It is her or my girlfriend in the apartment. My son told me all of this. He said that my ex-wife and my daughter have been bashing my girlfriend and calling her homewrecker. Anyway, my daughter can live with her mother for the time being because, legally speaking, children here can decide which parent they want to live with at her age. The plot twist is that my son expressed desire to move in permanently with me instead, and I guess that it's because of all the drama. My son hates conflicts and confrontations. Of course, my ex-wife is now bombarding my phone because she believes that I've put my son up to this because my son said that he'll start packing a bigger bag today if I agreed to him moving in permanently. He talked about visiting her instead of living there, and I agreed. This is escalating very fast, and I don't seem to have found the brakes to stop the madness. My suggestions made things worse. Thank you for listening. If any 40 plus divorced parents have any advice on how to resolve this issue, I am all ears. If it is relevant in any way, I didn't leave my ex, she did. One day she sat me down without forewarning and told me that she wasn't happy anymore and wanted a divorce. Everything went fast afterwards and we were divorced six months later. It was never an affair or anything, but I think she liked someone, but it didn't work. After a few months, she said she regretted it and wanted to reconcile, but I didn't feel right about it, and one thing was her finality in her decision, but most importantly, I wasn't in love with her anymore. So she suggested us dating again. We were supposed to keep that a secret in case the spark didn't reignite, and we would have built up hope in our kids for nothing, but she probably told them anyway. I started dating my now girlfriend around the same time, and I fell in love with her. I ended things with my ex. The odd thing is that she cordially accepted my decision, but apparently she hasn't, and I'm reaping what we sowed now. God, it felt good to vent about it here. Thanks again. And again, any 40 plus divorced parents who would want to talk, hit me up. Absolutely not interested in input from a 20 year old with no experience of parenting. <laughs> hey man, don't call me out like that. In the comments, she she PC says, do right by the rat and get it a buddy because they're extremely social animals and will get really depressed and sad if they're alone. I had two pet rats that spent all their time together and they were so cute and lovable. If they have a companion, then they can be left alone without human interaction and be just fine. This, social animals when isolated in captivity can start to self-mutilate and even go so far as to die of depression by hurting themselves slash not eating. Get him a buddy, and he should be fine left with his buddy for a few days at a time. Question, are you saying a single rat? Like, as in only one? Does your daughter realize that rats need other rats in order to be happy? Agreed. Any good rat owner knows that they shouldn't be kept alone. Get a friend or two. My largest mischief was five. I'm down to two females and a neutered male now, and the cage feels so empty. I have three girls myself, and the fact that he said a rat, not rats, is what immediately caught my attention. I did share this post with the rat reddit because I was in such disbelief. You just gotta know they got it from PetSmart too. Info. Was the gift giver aware of the phobia? OP says, yes, my ex-wife knows that of course, and I even said that it couldn't come to my place. That was at the birthday party. Update. Well, people wanted an update and here it is. My daughter is refusing to talk to me and she's moved in with her mum and said that this is permanent. My son moved in here with me and I can see that he really enjoys it here. I have been blocking my ex-wife's number for periods at a time because I've been receiving all kinds of threats and insults from her saying I have manipulated my son against her. My son is a very quiet boy and he's never given me any impression that he's been having a bad time at his mother's. I only noticed when he moved here and started talking and opening up about how miserable he's been. The rat. Well, my daughter decided to free him, and she and her mom drove to the woods and just let it go. I'm no expert on rats, but that's the story. My girlfriend and I have decided to get a dog. Maybe that would change my daughter's mind about not visiting, although I must admit that life has been so much easier now when she isn't around making everyone go on eggshells not to set her off. Both her and her mom refuse therapy. Over and out. In the comments, Psychological Bit 5422 says, So the rat didn't work, so they basically just condemned it to death. 
That alone makes your ex a B-I-T-C-H. OP replies, I was shocked to be honest. Isn't there another way? Yeah, I mean, the pet store would have happily taken it back, maybe not for a refund, but would have taken it. Or they could have posted an ad on the Facebook marketplace as free to go to a good home, but they couldn't be bothered it seems. The rat was just a tool to try and control your life. She decided to free a domesticated rat? Yeah, it's probably dead now. You can't free domesticated animals, you can only abandon them to die. Also, letting any non-native species loose, and the species of rats the domesticated ones come from and not native to America, is illegal and environmentally destructive. So both of them are jerks and idiots for doing that. You don't get a pet and then decide that it's not working and dump it. If you must, you rehome it or have it put down. Edit. Also, if they just dumped it after they weren't able to force it into your home to make your girlfriend uncomfortable or keep her out altogether, clearly the one and only reason they even got the rat in the first place was to try and drive your girlfriend away. I'm sorry, but it really sounds like your ex has poisoned your daughter's minds against you to the point that keeping her far away is probably your best option. The best you can do is probably just tell her that you love her and will be there for her when she decides to try being a decent person, but you're not going to let her try to destroy your life, your son's life, and your girlfriend's life for some fantasy about getting the family back together or whatever else your ex is filling her head with. And you're done trying to accommodate her when all she does is try to terrorize you and everyone else in your life. Tell her you know exactly why she got the rat at all, since she clearly didn't want it as an actual pet, and you're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior from someone who is old enough to know better, especially when it involves hurting people and animals that have never done her any harm. Take care of your son and girlfriend. Maybe one day she'll wake up and see what a terrible person her mother is, but maybe she won't. And if she doesn't, blood or not, she's not the kind of person that you need in your life. My 33 female, husband, 38 male, wants to open up our marriage or separate. So my husband and I have been together for nine years and married for six. We have two sons, four and three. A little bit about our marriage. I stopped working when I became pregnant with our first son and never went back to work because we haven't needed it. My husband makes 400k working from home with a very flexible schedule. I tend to do more of the childcare since I don't work, but honestly not that much more. He loves spending time with our children, has a rather intense personality when it comes to organization, so he is very pro-cleaning, and one of his greatest passions, along with sex, is cooking so he plans and cooks more than half of our meals. We still have our ups and downs, of course, but overall, we're both very patient and caring people, and up until this point, a very patient and caring relationship. Our views on child rearing align more or less entirely, and my entire family absolutely loves him. His family is not in the picture. He grew up extremely poor in an unstable household. Before I got pregnant, we had sex 10 plus times a week as a baseline. Of course, sometimes one of us was too busy, or stressed, or physically unwell, and that was never a problem. All things usual though, we had sex more than once a day for years. Then we decided to have children. We both love children, and knew that this would change almost every element of our lives and marriage. In conversations around this, we did discuss the likelihood of sex being less frequent for a while, and it didn't seem like a big deal. During the pregnancy, we continued to have pretty regular sex. That changed drastically once my son was born. I just felt like I had zero libido, but my husband was extremely understanding at the time. He said that I just grew a human, so it makes sense for my body to be prioritizing different things. He was more or less happy with sporadic sex for the next two years, and I thought everything was fine. Once our youngest was around 18 months, he started to instigate more mornings and nights again. I turned him down a decent amount of times because I just wasn't feeling any desire for sex. After a couple of months of this, he asked me what he could do to help me get my drive back to what it used to be. He asked this gently, and I didn't respond as well as I could have. It was upsetting in the moment, and we ended up having really the first big fight of our marriage over it. 
We both ended up apologizing, but it was only a couple of weeks later that he instigated another talk about it. Mind you, it's not like we never have sex. We're probably having sex two to three times a week. He suggested that we get couples therapy and that maybe I should see an endocrinologist. I responded better this time and agreed. Hormone panels came back regular, so we tried a couple of different therapists for a few sessions each. Both basically said his expectations were unrealistic and partnerships are about compromise. In those sessions, my husband's response was that he isn't ready to compromise on something that is so important to him. He was asked if it's more important to him than having a healthy marriage, and while he said no, in hindsight, there was some definite hesitancy. Over the following months, I noticed a decrease in emotional affection on his end. It's hard to put a finger on, and for a while I told myself it was just in my head. He's still attentive, caring, and affectionate, but there's just a lack of depth in the intimacy compared to the past 7-8 to eight years. He also stopped initiating sex as often, which I was hoping was just him becoming more comfortable with some level of compromise. But I approached the subject with him, and he said that getting rejected multiple times a week wasn't healthy for his emotional disposition. So he's balancing how much he initiates with how much rejection he can handle. Obviously, I wasn't happy to hear this, and I explained to him that I wasn't rejecting him out of any lack of love or desire for him, and he said he knew that, but kind of brushed it off still. I've tried to get him to go to therapy by himself, but he insists that everyone has different methods for processing things, and therapy isn't one of his. So things continued like this for the rest of the year, and to be honest, I kind of thought that this was it. Then comes last night. He walked into our room after putting the kids down. We take turns reading them books before bedtime, and said he needed to have a serious discussion. I immediately knew that it was going to be about sex, because the only times in the nine years I've known him that he says, we need to talk, with such somber dread, it's about our sex life. I was not at all prepared for what he said though. Through tears? And mind you, this is the first time I've ever seen him cry from sadness. He said that he wasn't built to be in a relationship that didn't regularly express love through sex. He said that he would always love me and that I'd always be the mother of his children. But he can't and won't go on like this. He told me that he believes that there are only two options. Either we divorce and continue to co-parent, or we open up the marriage and he finds someone else to have sex with multiple times a week. Transparently, the first half of the ensuing conversation is a bit of a blur because of how emotional it was. I went from being devastated, bordering pathetic, to furious with more rage than I've ever felt in my life. I said some things I regret and didn't mean. He stayed relatively calm throughout it, but he did say that he wouldn't have a conversation with me if I kept yelling. Eventually, I calmed down and begged him to try and rekindle our sex life. I even tried to initiate right there, which is incredibly embarrassing right now, which he rejected. He said he was open to working on getting our sex life back to a place that was happy for the both of us, but that can't mean me having sex when I don't really want to, and that he has needs that he has to go elsewhere for now. I told him I didn't want to open up our marriage, and I begged him more to work it out. He said he needed some space and was going to stay with a friend of his for the night. I texted him early that morning to let him know not to come, and that I was going to take the kids to visit my parents for a couple of days. He was hesitant, but agreed to let me take them while I process. I don't know what to do. I don't want to lose this marriage, but the thought of him sleeping with other people hurts so effing much. I don't know what I'm looking for, or if there's any advice to be had. I feel like my world is collapsing, and it's my fault. My parents know something is wrong because of how distressed I am, and even worse, both of our sons can tell. I've tried to hide it, but I'm a mess. My husband says if we stayed together and he felt rejected regularly, he'll end up resenting me, and that it's better for our children to have separate parents than resentful ones. Should I open up the marriage or move forward with divorce? In the comments, SnewOnions382 says, I have bad news for him. Co-parenting means he will be a single dad 50% of the time. When and where does he think he's going to have sex 10 plus times per week when taking care of two children on his own? There's enough solid advice here, so I'll leave that alone, but I dig into logistically how he thinks this is going to go, because I don't think it's going to happen like he thinks it's going to happen. 
This right here is precisely why he wants the open marriage, so wifey will meekly and obediently stay home and provide childcare while he's out every night looking for someone to stick his dick in. Ugh, gross. OP, do not agree to this. Don't be your husband's bang babysitter. As soon as you open that marriage, you are a single mother. Someone with that level of sex drive is going to be consumed with new partner frenzy. One thing I find odd is he said he can't be in a relationship that doesn't regularly express love by having sex, but yet he wants to open the marriage up? And what? He's going to fall in love with someone else to get that high? You can have sex without love, but he says he explicitly needs to be in a relationship that regularly expresses love in a sexual way. I'm like your husband that I could have sex every single day, more than once honestly, and I absolutely equate love to sex and sex to love. However, I couldn't sleep with someone that I didn't have feelings for. My husband's libido was, and still kinda is, lower than mine, and he offered to open up the marriage on my side only. He had no interest in another person. I said no because he was more important to me than loveless sex. Also, the dude does realize two to three times per week is pretty effing awesome, right? One or more times daily just isn't feasible with kids and normal life stresses. If you enjoy the two to three times and want it that much yourself, you'd almost be considered a high libido person, honestly. He should read the dead bedroom subreddit. It's scary over there. My husband and I are finally reviving our dead bedroom after numerous years. Don't do it. You will regret it. Your husband sounds like a sex addict. Yeah, why is this not higher up? Dude's about to blow his life up over wanting sex twice daily. It's kind of the definition of sex addiction. Honestly, this is really tough. <laughs> Connor. <laughs> hmm, I don't know. This is a tough one. If you guys don't get that reference, my second channel, Marky Industries, where my mate Connor reads the stories, he says that all the time. I'm a man with a higher libido, and I can't justify your husband at all. Two to three times a week is acceptable. Instead of talking about an open relationship or divorce, he should agree and seek help from a sexual therapist. Both of you should do that in order to find a compromise. If he's adamant on his position, then divorce him. It'll probably be better for the both of you. Finding sexual partners is easy. Finding a good partner and a good parent is 1,000 times harder. You, and especially him, should consider this. Update. I don't have the time to respond to individual comments at the moment, but I will tomorrow. Thank you for all your advice and support. I've spent most of the day talking with my mum while my dad took the kids on an adventure. I love my mum so much. She is such a rock. I do think we are heading for divorce, but I don't want it to be one of animosity. A lot of the comments are well-meaning, but really assume the worst of my husband. His position on sex is extremely immature and selfish. He is also an incredibly loving and kind person who has supported me through thick and thin. He holds himself to obsessively high standards, and while people will say that I'm naive, I know this man well, and I can't imagine him bearing the guilt of adultery. He simply thinks too high of himself and is too sensitive. He's staying with his friend from college, who is married. He's a godfather to their three children. His wife has already reached out to offer support if I want to talk, since she knows we're going through trouble. I don't think it's a stretch to say that he will regret this, but to those that think he's going to have trouble finding people to sleep with and run back to me, well, he was a regular in a sex and BDSM community in his 20s before we met. I knew this from early on, and he never stopped exercising six days a week. I would like to tell myself that he would come running back after realizing it's hard out there, but I just don't think that's the case. I think his view of the world is that if he does what is asked of him, he can ask the world to have his cake and eat it too. For people saying to take him for everything he has, I'm going to talk to a divorce lawyer this week. I will of course do my due diligence, but he's always been generous with his money, with charities, friends, etc., and loves his children as much as I do. I do not say that lightly. I'm not going to try and ruin him, as some have suggested. We're still going to be co-parents even if we separate, and I want to handle this with maturity. If we don't see eye to eye, then I won't shy away from court, but I honestly think he will sign whatever number I give if it's remotely fair. He's a bad partner for his decision, but you don't know him like I do, and he isn't a bad man. 
I've watched him struggle to figure this out, and he's too selfish to accept the obvious answer. But it isn't for a lack of remorse, just, I don't know, immense selfishness and a will that believes the world can be what he wants, while also wanting it to be one of love and compassion, if that makes sense. Thank you again. We'll respond to comments when I have time. Update 2. There are so many more comments and DMs than I could have imagined. Many of you have offered great advice and support. Many of you are well-meaning, but have obviously been hurt, and are projecting some of your anger onto a situation, rather than providing advice for the context provided. To everyone with good intentions though, I thank you so much. To the misogynistic, incels, creeps that are invariably coming out of the woods, screw you. My husband wants to meet and talk this evening. I am going to meet him. I'll give one more update after we meet, if that's allowed. There are too many comments at this point to respond to them, to answer some questions that seemed genuine. 1. Yes, he is obsessive, and yes, he has childhood trauma. These things don't excuse him from what I now realize was an entirely unacceptable decision to give me an ultimatum. 2. To say that the sex is good for me when we do have it would be an understatement. I'm not going to get into the details, but his appetite for life and energy is one of the reasons I fell in love with him. He definitely has an atypical view of sex beyond his extremely high libido. He would describe his view as not being orgasm-oriented, and he often doesn't orgasm. Strangely, that's not the important part for him. I used to joke that he has sex like he cooks. Most of the best meals and all of the best sex I've ever had have come from him. 3. The advice here has made me realize that we're probably going to get a divorce, and no matter what, he needs therapy. He is so high-functioning that I never really thought he needed it, but some of you have made excellent points, and my mind has completely changed on that. No matter what, I love him, and he will always be the father of our beautiful children, so I will try to convince him to go to therapy, even with us divorced. 4. I'm not going to spend any more time on the infidelity. I'm sure some people are sincerely trying to help, but there's obviously nothing I can say to convince many people that I'm not entirely naive or wearing rose-colored glasses. That's fine. I'm sure denial is the first step is true for lots of adultery survivors. Internet strangers project. It's what we do. 5. Yes, my libido was matching his pace for years. But I think a key difference may be that I wasn't like that before I met him. When we started dating, his friends endearingly called him an SLUT because he slept with a lot of women. I knew all of this. I was his first serious relationship at 29 years old, and I liked that. I always felt like his friends treated me a little special because of it. In hindsight, we should have talked about the inevitable, eventual decline in sex frequency. I remember looking across the table from him on one of our first dates when he said, I eat a lot of great food and have a lot of great sex. At 24, it sounded like he had figured out what was important. Now at 33, I don't think he's matured appropriately to recognize there are so many more important things. I feel sorry for the both of us that this is the case. 6. Reading divorce literally hundreds of times in the comments has helped, I think. It still doesn't feel real, but I don't feel uncontrollable devastation every time I think about it now. I'm trying to digest what is probably where my life is heading. I want the divorce to be one that is led with love. I don't care that internet strangers think that isn't possible. He may not be capable of living the life I want, but he's capable of that. Also, so many people are saying I should tell everyone why we are getting divorced. It's just another point that none of you know him. I promise he will tell them. He will say we are no longer sexually compatible. There will be shock, but probably not as much as I wish. He is an incredible friend and godfather to more than one set of friends' children. They will stick by him, just like he would stick by them. And now, onto the final update. So many people have expressed interest in an update, and I do feel somewhat indebted to those of you who gave advice and perspectives that have actually helped me. I wasn't really expecting my post to end up influencing me in any way, but it did make a difference. Relationship advice clearly stated in their rules that only one update is allowed, so I'm writing one here. 
I'll pay it forward and try to offer advice when I can to others from my main account. This will be my final update. Before I met my husband last night, I read every single comment and DM. Yes, every single one. With that in my head, I drove the hour to our home, leaving the kids at my parents. I went in with multiple intentions, but overall I wanted to keep my composure. I was scared to be hopeful, but I knew that deep down I was yearning for this to be a conversation where we felt connected. When I walked in, he was already sitting at the table. Jesus Christ, he looked like shit. This is a man who is typically hyper-composed. So before words were even said, I had already never seen him like this. He tried to ask me how I was doing and how the boys are. I was blunt and said that the boys are fine and are having a snow day and that he was the one who asked me to come here, so tell me what you want me to say. The way I said it didn't feel good as there was an air of coldness that is just so foreign to how either of us speak to each other, but it's how it came out. He started by apologizing and saying that he could have done better at organizing his feelings and presenting what he thought our only remaining options were. I didn't read too much into it, and because he almost always thinks he could have done better in every situation in hindsight and is rarely satisfied with how he performs. Then the surprise. He said that he thought about it and that opening the marriage wouldn't fix anything and that it was a desperate and frantic idea that he thought the night before. He said the only way forward is for us to separate. He said he had already gotten three months unpaid leave approved from work to handle things. He was breaking up a little bit already, and I was doing my best to not let that make me start breaking up too, because one of my goals was to try and stay calm. Part of me regrets my next move, and to be honest, I did it because of some of the advice. I looked him in the eyes and asked if he's already found someone to sleep with. It felt cruel after I said it, because I didn't believe that he had, and it obviously only hurt him further. Of course, he said no, and asked me if I thought that he was capable of that. I told him I didn't know what he was capable of anymore. He got more hurt. My emotional composure was pretty much ruined when I said that because it made me start to cry, but at least not sobbing this time. He said the same things that he said last time I saw him, that he would always love me, and that more important than anything is that I will always be our son's mother. We were both crying, but controllably. When the next thing came out of my mouth before I could even process it, I asked him if he's really ready to completely miss half of their lives. I knew obviously we were going to talk about our sons, but that question wasn't premeditated. It was a bomb. The last time I saw him was the first time I saw him cry from sadness, but it was controlled crying. The only words he managed to squeeze out were, I don't know what to do, and then absolutely break down. It isn't that I was in any way surprised by his love for our boys. I've known that since day one. I just honestly have never thought he was capable of losing control to the degree that followed though. He was sobbing uncontrollably, just as bad as I had the night he sprung the ultimatum, probably worse. In that moment, I didn't know what to do. My heart was breaking for him and I wanted to hold and cradle him like he's always done for me in that state. I was also still very angry at him, fair or not. I don't know how long I sat there, but I couldn't watch it that long before I was also crying harder and then just saying that I was sorry. I told him that I don't want to lose him, that he's the only person I want to wake up to every morning and share breakfast with our boys. He just said again and again that he didn't know what to do. I don't need to give further play-by-play, -play, but it feels important and pleasantly vulnerable to share that. When the heavy crying passed, we kept talking, and I eventually brought up that his friends, Jay, wife, had reached out to me. He said that he had shared everything with the both of them. This wasn't a surprise given he was their best man at their wedding and godfather to their children, and to the comments suggesting my husband was sleeping with literally his 20 years best friend's wife, I'm sorry for the gross world that you live in. I asked what their advice was. They both said they would love him no matter what happened, but he should really get a therapist. I asked if he was going to, and his first response was that he didn't want to, but a couple of months after that, he said that if both of them think that he needs one, then he's sure that they are right, and he's going to find one that works for him. This felt like all the light I've been looking for in this dark chapter. In hindsight, I wish we would have involved any of his closer friends earlier. They are his family. 
He respects my advice and seeks it out, but I was another party in the matter, and from his mind, my suggestions were just that. Now the people he loves and respects, and he believes they understand him, which is a list of like five people, have told him to go seek therapy for his relationship to sexual expression and validating love. As soon as he said he was going to go try therapy, I grabbed his hands and swore that I would work harder to give him what he needs. I told him that I can't view my life with anyone but him, and I don't want either of us to miss a Christmas or birthday or any other important moment in our son's lives. I told him let's go to Europe for a month. We've been once since the kids were born, but we took both of them, and it was kind of a visit our friends in Europe who want to meet our kids tour. But also, this was an idea that I remember reading from a comment, so thank you. I promised many more things and meant them. We let my parents know that I wouldn't be coming back for the boys' night. I've overshared this experience in a way that is really weird and I won't ever do again, but it feels good. I'll leave the rest between my husband and I. I told my husband about the post and asked if it was okay with him if I wrote an update about what happened. He was concerned about anonymity, but I explained all the info I'd given and decided he didn't care, which is his way of saying that he does care, but he chooses not to care because he controls his relationship, not the other way around. He warily, with a touch of self-aware humor that is so on brand for him, asked if he wanted to see the post and replies. I told him that he doesn't, to which he laughed and said okay. He doesn't use Reddit or any social media since he quote-unquote knows how the sausage is made. Neither of us are fools. We have a long road ahead and there is no guarantee that it will work, but I'm going to try harder. Reading the comments made me realize some of this was indeed my fault, Not necessarily for doing anything wrong, but for misjudging what was at stake. I knew my husband felt bad about himself when he laid next to me wanting physical intimacy and knowing that I didn't. I truly didn't know, and maybe to a degree didn't listen, to how bad that it hurt him. To say that he overanalyzes things would be an insult to the franking incredible ability that his mind has for assessing so many possibilities, seemingly at the same time. He's been laying in bed with that feeling, just building and building and building. This isn't about physical sexual release. Masturbating, or even screwing someone else, wasn't going to release this. My husband is a hyper-sexual being, and that's okay. I love him entirely, including that part, and I need to do a lot more work to be better positioned to get into a mood of sexual desire more often. But he needs to not feel explosive rage at himself on the inside when he doesn't receive the sexual intimacy every night. If we didn't have kids, I would feel less optimistic. I told him this is not impossible though, and we can work on this together. We've always been a team at everything else. We have got to be a team here too. This is now a kind of meandering rant, so I'll close it up with a few random points that I thought about because of this thread. So many people asked, and he said I could share. My husband is a network engineer. He taught himself to code as a teenager, for less than savory reasons, but he lived in slums and ethics are complicated, and got a full ride to one of the top programs in the country. Financially speaking, he's had a cushy life ever since. His words. I know he's damn good at what he does, but he also benefits from always handling finances like an obsessive analyst with a huge ego. Also his words. The most common response by far was that I should divorce him, with about half of those saying that I should do it happily, and basically he sucks and is a piece of crap with no respect for me or women. These made me reread my post more than anything. Maybe there was some unintentional villainizing of my husband in my post. But I tried my best to give the situation and describe his character. As a social experiment, I wonder if it would have been any different if I specifically mentioned his second most contributed charity is a women's and children's shelter, entirely due to his childhood trauma, but still sweet. This is going to be the most controversial piece, but screw it. Reddit loves spice. In total transparency, there is very much a sense of desire to control my body from my husband, The interest is purely based on the premise of enthusiastic consent. It's a part of him though, and I've known, and mostly admired, his relationship to that part of himself for most of my time knowing him. 
The same date when he told me that he has a lot of great sex and eats a lot of great food, he asked me what my relationship to control was. It's an interesting thing for everyone to think about. He told me then and there that his relationship with control was very intense, that he is very sensitive to not wanting to coerce anyone into being controlled because he furiously opposes anyone trying to do that to him. He knows it's in his personality, and he tries to be very self-aware of it, especially when interacting with friends, and most importantly, our sons. You cannot understand my husband without understanding this. He tracks everything about his life. He journals every night and keeps all entries for the past 20 plus years of his life in a private server that he runs in our basement. He runs data analytics on it, just as he does with our finances and practically any other information he can coalesce. People have asked if he's neurodivergent. Well, he isn't socially challenged at all, but he certainly isn't a normal person, if that's the question. He also had a serious sleeping disorder since he was a young child and only sleeps like four hours a night, yet he still has way too much energy. He is beyond special and I love him and I'm grateful to be with him. Many of you made sure to remind me of how special he is. Many of you hated him, but if you knew him, I think very few of you would feel that way. And even if you did, he's my husband, and I deeply hope that we can make it stay that way. I'm going to do everything in my power to keep it that way. As one person messaged me, F your husband. No, seriously girl. Please do whatever work you need to do to help you screw your husband. You both deserve it. Thank you everyone who helped and those who tried. Oh, and to the misogynists, eat shit. In the comments, Infusion Delusion says, Oh, I am so glad that you both sat down and communicated so generously and honestly with each other. I was worried that he had pushed himself so close to the edge that he wasn't thinking straight. He is an exceptional man, but you are also an exceptional woman both realizing what is at stake and willing to compromise after ultimatums were mistakenly delivered. There is a way forward as a happy couple and family. Keep communicating and finding solutions that satisfy and enrich both of your lives. All the very best. Love wins. The road to repairing the relationship begins when both parties are willing to do the work. You each have to meet each other halfway. You each have to be willing to admit how you have contributed to the issue and work on never relating those mistakes again. I've been married for 20 years. My marriage is not perfect because no one is perfect. We are together because we are perfect for each other. Our love has lasted because we made the decision to put in the work. OP, I wish you well on this journey and hope that you both find your way back to each other. Am I the asshole for rejecting my colleague's request to make her lunch? So I have a habit of making my own meals to work, simply because I love cooking and health-related issues. So I just started a new job in a new company three months ago, and seeing me make my own lunch every day has gotten me some attention from some colleagues. With that, I was able to talk and mingle in a new environment. My colleagues tend to ask things like recipes, how long did I take to make it, and so on and so forth. Just small talk questions. Everyone was okay, except for this one girl from the same department as me, which I will name her as Sally, 27 female, a junior designer. From the first day she saw my lunch, Sally has thrown in a lot of comments like how envious she is that I could cook my own meals, etc. It was fine until after one week later, she started asking me questions like, so when will you make me lunch? I was taken aback, but I thought she was joking and just waved it off with a smile and a nod. After that, at least once a week, Sally would ask me the same question again, and sometimes she'd even say things like, you still owe me a lunch made by you, or she'll whine about me not wanting to cook for her. I have kindly turned her down every time she brings up this issue. Last Monday, she offered to pay me $3 if I made her lunch. I told her no again, and she was visibly upset. She told me it can't be that hard to make her lunch since I'm already cooking for myself every day, am single, and I'm being unsociable and unfriendly by not making her food. Since then, she has been passive-aggressive towards me, as well as not willing to cooperate at work when I hand her new tasks. It has made me feel bad about it, and I have no idea how to go about this. Should I have just made her lunch just to keep the peace? 
This feels horrible, and I don't know how to deal with it. Edit. After reading all your comments, I think I'll try to talk to Sally about this, and if this doesn't get through to her, I'll have to discuss this matter with a same-ranking colleague or my supervisor. Sad face. In the comments, Tazin says, Not the asshole. She's acting extremely entitled and is now harassing you and ignoring the work you're doing and not cooperating with you. You need to go to HR like yesterday. She's interrupting the flow of work just because you won't cook for her. $3 doesn't even cover food costs, much less your labor and time. And even then, even if she paid full price, you shouldn't have to because she is jealous. HR, yesterday. Once you do this, she will never let up about it and desire it every day. OP says, To be honest, when she said $3 was her best offer, I was too stunned to speak. I'm not sure if HR will look into this, but I think I'll try it tomorrow. Remember to mention that she is being uncooperative at work because of this. This is a risk to profits and the flow of the work environment. They'll have no choice then. OP says, Thanks, I'll take note on it. The phrase you want for HR is creating a hostile work environment. Yes, your coworker is hurting office productivity, but that phrase is one they're trained to take notice of. Doesn't hurt that it's also accurately describing what she's doing. Hostile work environment has a specific legal definition, and it isn't just, my coworker is an entitled, incorrigible asshole. Going in too hot could potentially backfire. I'd go through the chain of command and have a chat with my boss before jumping to HR. Not the asshole. The actual goal and entitlement from Sally. Does she think that money grows on trees for you? She can make her own lunch, like an adult. OP says, Wow, you just reminded me that she did once try to pry about my salary on my first day. Maybe I do need to bring this up to my supervisor. Yes, I wouldn't definitely consider it. I can't believe she tried to ask about your salary on the first day. Hot take, but I don't see the problem with talking about your salary. Anyway, not the asshole. Sally is completely delusional. What's stopping her from learning to make her own lunch? She's 27, not 7. Please don't start making any food for her, as she'll keep this up for as long as the both of you are at the same workplace. This needs to go to HR, as it's impacting your work. She's flirting. That was my thought as well. She's flirting with OP and OP isn't flirting back, so now she's resorted to making OP's life difficult. My opinion here is that OP is not the asshole, and that, yeah, it does seem to me like it's flirting. But just because it's flirting doesn't mean it's okay for her to flip the switch on OP when he says no to her and rejects her. For her then to be not cooperative, to start sabotaging work and everything, I feel like that's a bit of a dick move on her part. But I don't think that OP would be an asshole for going to HR or their bosses about this to try and stamp out the behavior before it escalates. Update. For those who said Sally is flirting with me, I am 26 female and Sally is anti-LGBTQ, so I think flirting is highly impossible. For those who asked about my job, I work in a design agency as a senior designer. Sally is my work junior. I work closely with the juniors as I oversee their work. Also, I'm actually from Southeast Asia. I used USD in my previous post because Sally legit told me $3 because USD is four times more than our currency. Somehow she believes it sounds nicer. So after reading some of your comments, I have given it a long thought about how I want to approach this issue. With that, I decided to not make lunch today and bring Sally out for lunch as to confront her about this whole lunch thing privately. I offered to pay for her lunch on the condition that I pick the venue, and she was quick to agree, and her attitude went back to how it was before I declined her request. Which I find weird, but yeah. I was first relieved that at least I could talk to her about things, and hoping that I can iron this out on my own. That 40 minutes of my life felt like hell. I brought up the issue of me not being comfortable with her recent attitude and her requests after we've ordered our food. The whole time I was talking to her, she either zones out or just retorts with, why? Or, why not? Here's a little snippet of how our conversation went. Me. Sally, your constant pestering about how I should make you lunch is making me uncomfortable. I'd appreciate if you stopped that. She says, why? I mean, like, I don't cook for anyone other than myself, Sally. Why? 
Because, Sally, I'm your colleague, not your boyfriend or mum or family. She says, but I don't see why you couldn't make me lunch just once. I'll pay you double this time. It felt like the conversation was going nowhere. The rest of lunch was filled with awkward silence. Sally would just sit there and stare at me without saying anything, and I'm not sure if it's just her zoning out, or she's somewhat pissed at me. She didn't even apologize. Not once. The whole thing made my stomach feel weird, like something's grabbing my guts and twisting them around. The tension between us was awkward, even the whole way that we walked back to the office. Another senior designer, Mark, took notice, and he pulled me away to talk about work. Sally gave me one more look and then walked to her seat. Mind you, up until this point, I've never talked to anyone in the company about Sally and the things that she has told me. I was brought into a breakout room, and Mark went straight to the point. Did Sally ask you for something ridiculous or weird? It turns out some people in the office were unhappy with Sally and her little antics. She once pestered a colleague into buying her souvenirs, as this colleague does a lot of work travelling. In meetings, she would zone out when people are talking to her, and she would always shift the weight to someone else. For example, well, we have X, so there's nothing to worry about. Also, few times she'd take bits of food off of guys' plates, like fries, and would giggle if anyone tried to tell her off. If the giggling doesn't work, she would retort to the same whys and why nots that I got during my talk with her. Mark suggests I should make arrangements with my supervisor to talk about it. They have all done it earlier this year, and that stopped her from doing what she did to them. Well, most of them. She still zones out in meetings or mid-conversations. I thanked Mark for his suggestion and decided that it was a necessary next step. I've told my reporting manager about the gist of things, and I'll be having a meeting with him tomorrow to give him more in-depth details. Somehow, it's assuring to see how he actually had to massage his forehead followed by a long sigh when I mentioned Sally's name. I hope things will get better after this. P.S. As I was typing this, I couldn't help but think back on Sally's behavior towards me throughout these three months, and at most times it's weird, and I don't know what to make of them. Maybe I'll make a separate post about it if anyone else is invested. In the comments, Eats My Fridge says, So if it's not about her, she literally does not care. That's why she's zoning out and not taking no for an answer, because it doesn't make any sense to her that something wouldn't be for or about her. How the hell did she get this far in life? OP replies, To be honest, I'm very baffled by the openly zoning out when people are talking to you. Kinda disrespectful. She kind of sounds narcissistic, self-centered, and all that. She might legit have a mental disorder. Normal people don't behave like that. You do you, OP. Is there any chance she's neurospicy, or is she just taking the piss? I do that sometimes. I like to have a bit of a chin wag, you know? Does it matter? She's been spoken to about this behavior several times, it seems, by supervisors and OP, and she doesn't stop. Whether she originally knew that it was rude or not, after she'd been told to stop, she doesn't. OP says, To be honest, I wish I knew. I've only ever talked to her when there was work-related matters. Other than the topic about my lunch, she fails to hold in most casual conversations. You've handled this very professionally. It seems she struggles to understand appropriate boundaries. She likely needs professional help with this. I wonder if the supervisor can suggest this. OP says, I'm not sure about this, but I do plan on bringing this up during the talk with my supervisor tomorrow. I do hope for a way to help Sally, as Summer pointed out, this isn't normal for anyone. Honestly, you should have gone to your supervisor first. I can't believe you tried to do this outside of the work environment. In the US, this would have been a huge no-no. Could have easily, and still can, backfire. Especially since you were senior while she is your junior. OP says, Sadly, this ain't the US, and in my work experience thus far, superiors and HR don't usually think cases like Sally are worth the time to look into. However, with how things are turning out right now, I'm glad the new company does take work relationships and work environment seriously. Update. Not sure if anyone considers this an update, but I just want to write this out. I've talked about the whole Sally thing with my friends over Discord last night while we were playing games. Apparently, some of my friends attended the same art school as Sally and was at one point sharing the same few classes. This is quite a famous art school in my country. If you tell people that you're a designer, people's first guess would be that you've studied there. 
From what I've gathered from my friends, in short, they've described Sally as a person with bad social skills, but is naturally gifted in design. She doesn't talk much, but whenever she decides she wants to be friends with you, she could only spout questions that are uncomfortable to most people. In one instance, Sally asked a classmate why did her parents get a divorce. With such, they've concluded that she has bad social skills, but they've never seen her reacting negatively when people don't respond to her. They were shocked when I told them that she was being uncooperative at work. Also, according to them, Sally behaves in a way that suggests her parents shield her from the world a lot. She's unaware of many things that's deemed common sense for most. She once became paranoid because she learned about scams in college and believed by picking up one phone call from a stranger, that would land her in a lifetime of debt. She's also very insecure about many things. For example, her looks, her weight, relationships, etc. At the end of the day, they didn't know much about Sally personally because back then, they thought she was nosy by always asking people very personal questions. However, Sally does have a few friends in college. With this in mind, I recall how Sally asked me weird questions such as my salary, as well as me joining the company as a senior despite her having more work experience than me, as well as trying to dump her relationship problems on me. Maybe it is her attempt to trying to be friends with me? And now that I think about it, she needs some sort of professional help more than discipline for her actions. In the comments, she definitely has some social issues and probably needs therapy, but her behavior goes beyond just not understanding social cues. She may be neurodivergent. I'm neurodivergent myself, and her parents protecting her has stunted her development greatly. But that's not an excuse for breaking boundaries continuously and only stopping when a higher-up is brought in. She must be an amazing designer to still have a job after all of the things she's done and how she just doesn't seem to contribute to the team. She sounds like a nightmare to deal with, to be honest. OP replies, Yes, she does do good work, and I do realize her behavior is not something that you'd see every day. I've suggested to my supervisor that if it's possible for the company to kind of talk her into getting professional help, since we do have this benefit called mental health claims. Nonetheless, I do hope for the best for Sally. Unfortunately, I have no means nor the capability to help her. And now, on to the final update. Hello everyone, this will be the final update. It took me a little while to write this post because I was busy at work. First of all, I'd like to thank you internet strangers for all the advice and similar experiences. It helped me a lot with navigating this situation as a whole. However, I am still baffled by such behaviors, especially in a work environment where I was taught that people are professional there. Anyways, on to the main topic. I had my meeting about the issue I had with Sally first thing in the morning. I told my manager that the main problem is work, about how uncooperative she was with me. It didn't take long for him to link this whole thing back to Sally making unreasonable requests for colleagues again. He didn't exactly tell me what the company would do at the time, but mentioned that the company would take appropriate measures in regards to this. Soon enough, an email was sent to Sally with all the senior designers CC'd in. In short, Sally will be put into probation as well as having a 30% pay cut as she's been assigned to a more stern and experienced senior designer. I heard she's really scary for work evaluation. Sally only gets one more chance to keep her job. One more of those requests from her after this would result in her termination. Sally started kicking and crying upon reading the email as she yelled, It's not fair! repeatedly. Everyone looked at Sally briefly and then went back to their own business. I saw some colleagues put on their earphones and raising the volume, some put on earplugs, and the ones sitting near her would just walk away with their laptops. No one consoled her. Everyone just pretended that she wasn't there. It felt as if I was watching a movie at this rate. Still a little worried that Sally would do something to me, I asked Mark if he could sit with me during lunch in case Sally tries anything. I'm not sure if Mark meant it as a joke or what, but he said, no worries, she's not smart enough to link this back to you. Lunch since that day has never been so peaceful, and I'm looking forward to more peaceful lunches as long as I'm with this company. In the comments, Tazin says, congrats, this is on her, not you. She has burnt out everyone, including senior management, by demanding that people cater to her. 
She can either wise up or find another job, but no job is going to think that this is acceptable. OP replies, I'm pretty sure she would do anything to stay. I feel like she's comfy in this company. It's been a few days, and so far Sally has been on her best behavior and a little more scared most of the time due to her newly assigned senior being super strict. I do hope she'll really change and learn from this. Either way, I'm free from this issue, and I'll be interviewing a couple of junior designers to fill up Sally's place soon, praying that I won't get another Sally. I worked with a girl once that was like this, highly intelligent and extremely good at thinking outside the box, but had a hard time thinking inside the box, especially the box labeled social skills. I forgot some papers once, and I figured I'd pick them up on Saturday evening when I was in the area. It turned out she was living in the office because it's free, no commute, and just empty space after working hours. I also had to tell her not to go home with the kind old man who just wanted to give her a free phone. How did she shower? Well, the office encouraged green commutes and the use of bicycles, so our underground parking had a corner where you could hose off your bike. This is incredibly sad. I hope she's alright and in a better situation now. Oh, she didn't do it because she couldn't afford an apartment. Rent was cheap in the area and we were paid the same. She just didn't want to spend it on rent. Girl loved to travel, so that was her priority. Well, I suppose she has her own priorities? I still hope that she has a home of some kind now, even a room somewhere to call hers and to keep her things in. But I suppose if it was by choice, then that's a somewhat less tragic situation. Can't say I was expecting that based on how it sounded at first, though. Yeah, sorry about that. I often forget that I live in a privileged country where homelessness isn't really an issue. We didn't work together for very long. She told me she usually worked for about a year to save up, then she would quit and travel until the money ran out. Rinse, repeat. Last time I checked on her, she was working for a foreign aid organization. No idea what she's doing now since Facebook is dying. Knitted Jedi says, quote, Sally started kicking and crying upon reading the email as she yelled, It's not fair! repeatedly. These aren't the actions of a mentally healthy woman. I was just thinking about that comment, the one where her parents sheltered her, because this sounds exactly like a woman that I used to work with. Her parents and their money made everything easy. The first time she encountered conflict at work, she literally stomped her foot, hysterical crying over minor inconveniences. I hate the word hysterical in its connotations, but it's the only word that fits. The problem was so simple to identify. She had never encountered conflict as an adult in an adult environment. She was sheltered, and that had made her spoiled. She acted like a child when her behavior inevitably caused conflict, because she'd never learned another way to resolve issues. She did the why thing too, again, like a child. Not healthy at all. My 27 female, fiancé 27 male, secretly went to Paris to see a female friend. So my fiancé Eric has a close friend Jane, 20s female, who lives in Paris, France. She had moved by the time that we were introducing each other to our friends, so we've only met over video chat. Eric and I have been together for a year and a half, and before we got together, he and Jane were involved. He told me that it ended badly, but they did get over it. I don't know exactly what happened, as I've never asked. She's really important to him. They do talk once or twice a month over text or video chat, and I know that they have a lot in common. I don't know Jane's situation, but Eric's parents were abusive, and I've pieced together that Jane's were as well. I've never gotten the impression that either one wants to go back to how it was, and he's never given me a reason to be insecure, until now. He asked me to marry him three weeks ago, and I said yes. I was really excited to marry him, but then suddenly a few days ago, he announced that he needed to go visit family. Which was weird because he cut off his family several years ago. He has expressed to me that he has no interest in seeing them again. He said that it was an important family emergency, and then just left. He kept me updated, and we talked a few times on the phone. He told me that his mum was having health issues. I have no reason to be suspicious. Edit, I'm reading that over, and it sounds weird, but he's always been very touchy when it comes to talking about his family, and I just didn't want to push it. 
But then, a couple hours ago, I got a message from Jane asking if Eric was okay. I said that he was visiting family, so he was probably just a bit stressed out, which is why he wasn't responding to her messages. She then informed me that he is in Paris with her and snuck a photo of him in her apartment. I haven't replied to her yet. I'm freaking out. I have no idea what to do. He just got on a plane to fly over 12 hours to see her without telling me, presumably last minute. Why is he there? Do I talk to him? Has anyone else been in this kind of situation before? In the comments, Blue Dolphins 1221 says, Did you ask her for more details on why she asked if he was okay? Unfortunately, he lied to you. He fabricated a story, he runs off to see her. Did he have second thoughts and wants to see if she still wants to try with him? OP says, I haven't replied to her yet since she sent me the photo. The first message was, Hey OP, is Eric okay? He's acting a little strange, which I assumed referred to him not responding. When she told me that he was in Paris, she wrote, Um, he's here? And just sent me the picture. He's asked to marry you, and now he's having a crisis involving her. Maybe he's realizing what they had isn't over, to him at least, and he's trying for one last shot. Either way, he's a liar, and I'd be done with his ass. If she's messaging you to ask if he's okay, then she's not in on whatever feelings have driven him to visit her. My reading of that is that he's still into her on some level and wanted to see perhaps if there was any reciprocal feelings. If I were you, I'd rethink the relationship. This chap is not 100% sure that you are it. I'm so sorry. He probably proposed to OP to see how Jane would react and then waited for the right time to confirm if his move gave her any realizations about their relationship. Just keep talking to Jane and don't say shit to him. If y'all live together, then use this time to figure out your future living situation. If you don't live together, then use this time to completely remove him from your life. A man that lies this easily to you isn't one that you should tie yourself to legally. That's ignoring all the other flags that are waving about. I'm with these guys on this one. This is definitely not a normal situation. It is not something that was communicated. He took a flight 12 hours out of the country to see this woman. I would hope that for most people this is a deal breaker because what is going on here? I don't actually know if he can talk his way out of this one. I would leave if someone were to disrespect me to this level and not explain themselves. And now on to the update. Thank you for all the comments and advice. I read every single one and I appreciate all of the advice. I'm sorry for the late update, but I'm extremely tired and haven't really sat down in a week and a half. To just get to the point, I left him. A lot of people were concerned that he'd find the post, but I did change a lot of the details. The main issue remains the same though. Jane lives in a foreign country, at least 12 hours away, and he decided to go to her without telling me. I also did see some comments discussing the age gap between Eric and Jane. Jane is in her late 20s. I said 20s because I wasn't sure at the time how old she was. After I posted and the comments started rolling in, I had to shut my phone off. There were so many people saying that Eric wanted to be with Jane, that he wasn't over her, and I started having a panic attack. I'm not an insecure person usually, and Eric had given me absolutely no reason to be, but this whole thing, I felt very stupid and like I'd been blind. He was always very open about his friendship with Jane and how much she meant to him, but there was absolutely nothing that made me think he still has feelings for her. Honestly, even if he told me he wanted to visit her without me, I'd probably have said that that was fine as long as I got to go on my own vacation. Anyway, I got Jane on the phone the next day. Her story is that he just showed up at her door, claiming that he missed her and that he just needed to get away. She provided proof that she had no idea he was coming, and I have no reason to not believe her when she tells me nothing happened. I think she was angrier than I was. At the time, she figured that something really bad must have happened, either with me or with his family. She knew from past experiences that it was better to just let him talk when he was ready rather than pushing it. She gave it two days, during which he was behaving very impulsively, kept spacing out, and he brought up their past multiple times. They hadn't seriously spoken about it since it ended years ago. He is usually the calmer, more level-headed of the two of them, so this behavior was extremely out of character. Finally, she decided to text me to see if I knew anything. 
After I told her that he was with his family, she put it together pretty quick that I had no idea where he was, and she confronted him about it. They got into a massive fight that lasted for hours, and she eventually told him to leave. She didn't really tell me what the fight was about, just that she yelled at him for not telling me, but after talking to him, I've got a hunch. Jane and I talked for a long time. Both of us were crying by the end of it. I think this whole thing opened up some wounds. She told me their history, a lot of which really surprised me, like how they weren't really even boyfriend-girlfriend, and he's the one who ended it. He'd always given me the impression that it was a bad, but ultimately mutual breakup. It was just a really toxic situation for the both of them, and it took them a long time to get back to being actual friends after. Which brings me to my conversation with Eric. He showed up a few days after I talked with Jane. I had packed up and left to a friend's at that point. He came over to talk. My friend was in the place the whole time. We talked for a while, and I asked him a hundred questions, and he answered five of them. He said he was sorry that he can't provide an actual explanation for what he did because he doesn't understand why. I said that that wasn't good enough, and I needed him to tell me what happened. He said he couldn't because I won't understand. I suggested couples therapy for us. He's been doing it individually since before I met him, but he said he didn't want to. He just wants to forget that it happened. The positive explanation I have is that he had some kind of freak out after we got engaged, or maybe something did happen with his parents and he couldn't talk to me about it, which is fine. I don't necessarily think that if someone is struggling, the first person they should always go to talk to about it is with their partner. I'm totally fine with him going to Jane if he was freaking out over the prospect of us getting married, or if he did hear something about his mum. Obviously, don't fly to another country and lie about it, but that goes without saying. Jane could probably understand that better than I could, and would know what to say, but he can't even talk to me about it now, nor is he making an effort. So, how does that bode? He just wants to pretend that everything is fine and normal, and I just can't do that. On top of all of that, up until now, he's never been secretive about how he feels, or what he's thinking about, or his history. He hates talking about it and is touchy about people asking a lot of questions about it, but he's always told me stuff if I ask. I think if he was panicking over getting married or if something actually happened with his mom, then he would tell me. I couldn't help myself and asked if it was because he just doesn't want to talk about the fact that he wants to be with Jane and regrets how he treated her. He denied it, but I think I hit a nerve. He claimed that he doesn't have any leftover feelings for her other than the fact that she's a big what-if. She's important to him, but she's the past, and I'm the future. This may just be my fear talking, but what if this whole time he's been using me to try to make Jane jealous because he's realized that he lost her, and he went to see her to see if she still wanted him just in case? I think that's what they fought about. I think he went there to see her because he realized he still wants her. And she's been off living her life without him, no problem. It's bad enough if that is the case, but if I take him back, what if she changes her mind? I don't have a reason to believe that she will change her mind. She doesn't talk about him the way that I talk about someone that I'm romantically interested in, and now that I know their history, I wouldn't want him back either. But who knows? After our conversation, it is obvious that he's not 100% certain that he wants to build a life with me, and he's not willing to do what it takes to fix this. I'm not worth the work. He won't even try. And that's basically the big issue for me. I can't build a life with someone who won't put in the efforts. So I don't want to be with him. I told him to leave, and he left without a fight. I've blocked him on everything. I've talked to Jane a few times since, and they have spoken. She told me that he's probably going to take some time off work and figure stuff out. I hope he can get some help. Plus, I know it sounds utterly bizarre, but I think I've actually gained a friend in her. She's checked in on me multiple times, and even helped put me in touch with a new place to live that I just moved into. I'm really tired. It's been a really horrible and busy time. Thanks for the support and the advice. I'm glad I found out now, before we had started seriously planning, or worse, after we got married or had children. If I find out anything more, I'll update on my profile. If anyone has any advice on how to deal with the embarrassment or good ice cream flavors to get through the pain, though, let me know.
In the comments, Winterfront1431 says, It definitely sounds like he was trying his luck with Jane. Maybe thought he could get something to happen and then come back and either have got it out of the way or leave you for her. Don't wait around for him. Keep him blocked. And OP says, I think it's pretty funny that he seems to have thought that the woman who moved away to a foreign country has been sitting around for the past few years waiting for him to want her. Incognito Landshark says, I'm so sorry for what he put both you and Jane through. And if he is in counselling like he stated, it's not working because this shows he has some deep, unresolved issues that he thinks can be fixed with the right partner. Jane is a good person. I wish both of you well. And OP says, No, seriously. She's my hero, and I genuinely hope that he gets the help that he needs. I don't want him to be miserable forever. He was a good partner until all of this. My experience with him doesn't match up all that much with Jane's experience with him. I do think he's got unresolved issues, but it also sounds more like he's taking some form of drug if he has no history of manic breakdowns. Not acting himself and jumping from topic to topic with Jane sounds like a manic episode or drug involvement. And OP says, He doesn't have a history of manic breakdowns that I know of, but he does have significant mental health issues, and these come with their moments. But up until now, it's always been the I'm gonna stuff down my feelings because then they won't exist kind, more than I'm gonna do something crazy kind. But from what I've seen, he's always managed it pretty well. It could have been a manic episode. I definitely think that he panicked over something. I don't know about drugs, and I really hope it's not. That is such a manic episode. The impulsivity, the erratic behavior, the lying, and all of it seemingly out of nowhere. This doesn't look so much like he's taking drugs as he's not taking the ones that he should be taking. If he's not willing to commit to therapy and just wants to forget it, that shows that he knows what the problem is and doesn't want to get it treated. Nothing to do with her worth, though I do understand how this situation could make her feel that way. I love Jane though, I hope they continue their friendship. Yup, classic manic episode. Impulsive and ruin your life all in one episode. I agree with everything you said about treatment too. I've got bipolar and I've been there too. Nah, I don't need therapy. I just have to take some days to work myself out. Before I was treated and medicated was a classic for that. Dude's a walking train wreck if he won't get the help, so I'm glad Opie is out of it now. It sounds like he isn't in touch with his feelings and buries them until it really becomes real and then he panics. Some part of him seems like he is still stuck in the what ifs, the other is going ahead with his life until it becomes really real, and then the fear sets in, and then if he doesn't try to fix what was wrong, then what if again? Instead of dealing with it, he's just burying, and that isn't a good person to communicate with and be honest and trust with your feelings. So she is right to stop now as he isn't talking with her like you would be in a successful relationship. You can at least learn that is what you need when looking for someone else. You have values now that you can see what doesn't work for you. That isn't a bad thing for some people. Not to be an armchair psychologist or anything here, but it does seem like those were manic episodes that he was going through there. It does appear as though he may have bipolar. Perhaps this was just an event that was highly stressful for him, the straw that broke the camel's back on an already increasingly stressful life that he is leading before this, that made him crack, that made him just go into a manic state. And really, it's just burned both bridges with Jane and with OP in this situation. I know it's cringe to speculate on these things, but, you know, there doesn't seem to be too many other possibilities that it could have been here. And I feel like OP saying that he doesn't have a history of manic breakdowns doesn't exactly mean that he wasn't good at hiding whatever minor manic breakdowns he was having beforehand. OP's description of his behavior being the kind of I'm gonna do something crazy fits in really well with that risky behavior, irritability, and flights of ideas, symptoms that you would see with people with manic episodes. Regardless of the fact, it is up to him to make healthy choices for himself and for those around him, and he's only hurting people by doing what he has been doing and continues to do, it seems. I do wish him and OP the best going forward, but absolutely breaking things off and going cold turkey from this guy is the best thing that I think OP can do in this situation, so good job.
Unexposed post is by user Annoyed Latka, titled, Am I the asshole for not telling my parents that I converted? So I, 28 female, for background context, was raised Hindu and had two very strict parents growing up. My dad was very emotionally distant and had a lot of problematic views about all kinds of people. My mother was overly controlling and spent most of my teenage years trying to make me the ideal version of a daughter that she had in mind. I resented my family hugely, and as soon as I had the chance, I ran away to university and never really looked back. Nowadays I keep them at an arm's length and only see them twice a year or so, but I'm planning on cutting them off pretty soon. So I met Zach, 32 male, through work, and we've been together for about four years now. He had a totally different upbringing to me, and when he proposed two and a half years ago, I decided to convert to his faith. I didn't do it purely for him or anything because I had been interested in his religion for a while, and so when he proposed, I kickstarted the process. The conversion process was finally completed back in July, and then a month later, we married. I dote on my in-laws, and the way they treat me with love and kindness has always shocked me a little bit because I never had it growing up. I didn't invite my parents or anybody in my family because I know they would have absolutely disapproved of Zach, mainly because he's not Indian or Hindu. Zach and I don't plan on having kids for a few years, but the agreement would be that our kids would grow up exposed to Indian culture and would grow up with the two Indian languages that I grew up speaking. But they'd also be raised as reformed Jews until they were old enough to make an informed decision about what they wanted to be. One of my cousins dropped by completely by surprise last week and was totally surprised to find Zach in my apartment. She noticed our wedding picture and stormed out of the apartment. Long story short, my phone is now blowing up with messages from multiple family members saying that I've betrayed them and that my parents are going to die from grief. I've had a voice call of my mother screaming at me about how I've failed them once again as a daughter by ditching the religion that I was born with and that I've always been a failure. I've blocked their numbers for the sake of my sanity. Zach suggested leaving the country and I'm seriously thinking about it. Am I the asshole? Zach's family insists that I'm not and they personally think that my family are psychos. But at the same time, all the guilt tripping I'm being put through is starting to get to me. I know converting is a huge deal and everything, but at the same time I doubt my parents would have been supportive. Christ, with parents and family like that, who needs enemies, right? I just think from the get-go, if they realized that, hey, you're distancing yourself from everyone because you don't feel included in this family, because who knows, we're not the baddies, are we? You wouldn't have such an explosive and irrational response to finding this news out. If this family wasn't full of absolute psychos, they would approach this situation with empathy and with sadness being like, hey, what have we done? Um, I want to understand why you kept this all from me. But instead, they're just this gaggle of insanity that cannot be controlled. She's screaming at you over the phone saying, you failed me once again. That's just asking for the entire family to be cut off for good. I don't understand why people do this. Absolutely not the asshole OP. I can see why you don't like them and why you didn't invite them. Oh my god. In the comments, Irritated Mango says, Not the asshole. You made your own informed decision about something that literally doesn't harm anyone. Your parents are most likely lashing out because it doesn't look good for their image in the community. Sad I know, but it's a good possibility. OP says, Sadly, I think you're right. They were always obsessing over their image amongst their friends. And thank you. Not the asshole. Ultra conservative part of Indian culture is extremely outdated, controlling, and dangerous. They treat you not as their children, but their property, and as an extension of themselves. I would be concerned for your safety and leave the country. When they treat you as property, they are not beyond harming you. OP says, I agree fully, hence why Zach has suggested leaving the country now as opposed to next year when I wanted to go no contact. I highly suggest watching your back since they know where you live. I know it might not be common, but there is still way too many of these kinds of stories ending badly. You can never be too safe. You're not the asshole for converting, but it's worth mentioning that you've been maintaining a somewhat cordial relationship with them and haven't even told them you were married. 
I don't think you're an asshole for that, but you're just dragging out unnecessary drama for yourself by compiling all of these huge secrets. Either cut the cord and stop contact as you plan to do, or be honest. Not for them, but for you. They are not entitled to anything from you, but you owe yourself to live an honest and secretless life. And OP replies, I actually was going to go no contact next year because my current work are trying to see if I can get transferred to one of their international offices in the new year. It seemed safer to do it then, but now I'm reconsidering doing it now. And now, on to the update. Most of you told me that I wasn't the asshole for not telling them this, and thank you for that. It really helped stop me from feeling like I had been a terrible daughter, so I'm updating if anyone is interested. Zack and I ended our tenancy at our apartment, have temporarily moved to Scotland, and are currently in the process of moving to the Netherlands, where his aunts and uncles live. They knew about how bad my family were, but they didn't realize the full scale of it until my mother-in-law told them straight after that I had a nervous breakdown over the messages that my family were leaving me. Immediately, they offered to take us in, and one of his uncles offered to help sort out a work permit for me. Zach has an Irish passport, so the whole process is a lot smoother for him. My work couldn't sort out my transfer until next year, so I took up on that offer, and I'm finishing off sending the documents that I need for my work permit. His aunt mentioned our situation to a friend of hers, and that friend has offered to let us rent a small flat that he has until we can properly find our feet. We had a talk, and I'm going to change my name to my Jewish name instead to avoid being found. Thankfully, Zach has a very common Dutch surname, and my name is shortened to a fairly English one anyway. So, for the time being, it's a start. Thank you for all the support. The kindness of Zach's family and their friends continues to blow me away, and I can't quite believe that I've finally found my circle. This whole experience of being found out as having converted was very emotionally draining, but I'm glad that it's almost over. In the comments, LoveBeach8 says... I'm so sorry that you've had to go through all that crap, but I'm so happy for you now. May all your wishes and dreams come true, and enjoy your new life. And I'm so glad both of you are able to make sure your future children will never experience that toxic environment. Here is to a wonderful future. OP says, Hear, hear. Zach and I are very chilled about religion as a whole, and I know if my kids didn't want to be Jewish anymore, we'd still support them. That's the way to do it. So many people push their children away from God by shoving him down their throats when they're young. People need to relax, lol. And OP says, I can say from experience that this is true, and that's why my kids will never go through it. I would suggest creating new social media profiles, and be very wary who you add slash your privacy settings. I blocked not only my family, I blocked all their friends and followers so they couldn't find my accounts. Good luck, OP, and I hope your life with your husband is wonderful and full of peace and content. And OP says, Oh, that's a good shout. I'll do that and only have my in-laws, Zach's outer family, and my closest friends on it. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that OP is doing well. Religion and culture is complex, but people have their freedom to choose what they want to convert towards or believe in. OP's parents are controlling and not very good people as they don't really treat OP as a person but more like a property and object. Zach sounds like a nice person and his family also seem like very good people. I wish OP well in her future and her relationship with Zach goes swell. This is a normal Indian family by the way. Marrying someone outside your faith is a big no-no. Even intercaste marriages used to be looked down upon but those are reducing now. I, 26 female, will be co-workers with my former friend, 26 male, who I was abusive towards and bullied him continuously. I used to be a complete B-word during high school. There's no denying that. I'm very ashamed of the kind of person that I was. It was partly because my parents spoiled me too much with my good looks, which I had out of pure luck and chance, and myself too. I was extremely arrogant and selfish. There was this boy in high school, kind of a loner, always busy studying and doing projects, no friends, getting bullied quite often. He was very intelligent, always the best when it came to grades. I wasn't friends with him. I was one of the cool girls, and I only hung out with other cool girls and boys. 
I was usually the center of attention. There's always a gang of bad girls in schools, and I was their leader. I wasn't doing well with my grades, mostly because I wasn't spending time studying and was obsessed with other things. I had the selfish idea of using this boy, so I befriended him and let him close, in order to get some help in return with my studies, and he did help me a lot. Sometimes he helped me for hours before exams or coursework, and it helped my grades a lot. His friendship with me made him more popular as well. This kept going on for almost two years, and I knew he liked me, but I never considered that. He eventually asked me out, which I responded horribly to. I laughed at him, told him that he's not good enough for me, and since I didn't need his help anymore, I told him that I only befriended him so that he would help me. Not because I actually liked him in any way. I was a complete beer. After that, I asked other girls to make fun of him constantly, which made his life difficult. So, time passed and I only realized at college what a complete beer I was. To him and other people. I've had therapy, and I'm not the same person anymore. So right now I work in HR. I was going through the list of people who are starting to work for us next week since I'm the person who basically meets them on day one, handles all the processes, etc. And yeah, he's one of them. I want to make things right with him and apologize for my horrible behavior, but I don't know how to do that. What should I say? I really don't know. And when should I do it? It'll be extremely awkward on day one if he meets me as the person who welcomes him at the door without any prior knowledge. Should I contact him before his first day? P.S. I can't ask someone else to handle him when he arrives on the first day. I'm the only person who has this responsibility right now. In the comments, oh that this says, doesn't your company have protocol in place for this? It's pretty standard for HR to require opt-out for cases like this. Edit, that is, having an existing relationship or a history with another employee. Not necessarily a negative one, just any relationship. Isn't there someone else who can handle that group? And OP says, yes, in normal situations, but there is nobody else that is trained to do this job except me when he arrives, so I have to do it. As soon as he sees you, he is going to panic. I genuinely feel for the guy, and regardless of how much you may have changed, for him, that will be irrelevant. I would recommend at the first opportunity taking him into a private room and being open and honest to him about how sorry you are, Reassure him that you are aware of how awful a person you were, and because of him, you have made changes to your life. Don't make it about you from there. Because this is a pretty unique situation, you should make him aware that you would like to move forward, and that you understand if he does not wish to deal with you in the future, if he doesn't have to. It's also a possibility that he doesn't actually give a shit about you. I was bullied in high school, and one of the bullies saw me out and tried to apologize. I ignored him completely. He had lost any significance in my life, and his opinions or wants were simply not important to me. Apologize regardless, but do it privately, and do not under any circumstances talk to any other colleagues about the history. You really think he wants to spend any time with her? Let alone being dragged into some private room where she can bully him anew. She may claim to have changed, but to him, she'll always be that horrible person she was in high school. Not necessarily. I was bullied pretty badly in school, but if one of those people came up to me now and genuinely apologized for their behavior, I would accept and appreciate it. People change. I changed a lot. Why wouldn't my bullies? They don't have to suddenly be friends or even friendly, but it could potentially give him something many people don't get. An apology for past wrongs. Update. I'd like to thank all of you who gave me suggestions, those of you who believed me, those who didn't believe that I was a changed person or doubted my intentions. All of it helped me a lot. I love you all. So I decided to write him a handwritten letter and give it to him the day that he starts and move on professionally to the rest of the day and explained everything in the letter. Since I was the person who was supposed to welcome him to work, that meant that it had to be the first thing I was going to do. I took a lot of ideas about what you said to me, so this is the letter that I wrote. Hi James, you're probably surprised to see me here. I'm sure I'm not on your list of favorite people to randomly meet. Without any excuses, I want you to know how sorry I am about how I treated you in the past. When I look back at the things I've done, there's nothing in my life that I'm more ashamed of. I can't imagine how it must have been for you during that time, and I don't pretend to understand. 
I'm just sorry for all that I did. It haunts me every day in my life, and it should. You might think I'm only doing this to seek forgiveness to feel better about myself, or maybe I want to make sure nothing happens to my job and career, and you have every right to think that. But this letter isn't about asking you to forgive me, or telling you how much of a changed person I am. That would make it all about me, but this is about you. It's about where we are right now. We're going to be co-workers, and I want you to know that I will never, ever do anything that might make your life difficult at work. It's funny I say that, because my mere existence here will probably cause just that. And even if it doesn't, how can you trust any word that comes out of my mouth? You shouldn't. But that's all that I have to work with. I don't know how you think of me at this time, or whether you want to talk to me about the past or not. It's your decision, and I will comply to whatever you decide. If you decide not to talk about the past at all, I'm fine with that. When I return, we'll go through the rest of the formalities like professional colleagues, and we only speak when we have to. If you want to talk to me about the past, that's fine as well. Be assured that it won't be about me. If you need someone to yell at, someone to be angry at, or even a punching bag, I can be those things. You have every right to work in a place that you feel happy and safe, and if my existence threatens that, which is completely understandable, then we shouldn't work in the same place. So if that's the case, just give me the word and I will request a transfer or I will quit. This offer is open-ended. Regardless of what you decide or how you think about me, I genuinely wish you well. These are my contact details. So, on the day, when he saw me, he was shocked and clearly shaking. When I offered to shake his hand, he was very stressed. I proceeded to give him the above letter in an envelope and then invited him to his desk. I tried to act completely professionally. I gave him the very basic info, then told him that I'll be back with the rest of the things in half an hour, to give him time to read the letter and to feel more comfortable. When I was back, he was more relaxed. We went through the rest of the stuff, and at the end, he passed me a note which said, 6.30 Cafe X, which is right around the corner. So I went in there, and he was there. We sat there for a couple of minutes, not saying anything. Eventually, I asked how he's doing, and if he read the letter. Then he burst into tears, and I couldn't stop my tears as well. After a couple of minutes, he told me that he was ready to quit on day one if I hadn't given him that letter. I reminded him that I should be the one who leaves, but he told me that it's not necessary. He told me that for a couple of years he wished me dead, and even though he managed to move on, he never stopped feeling angry towards me until he saw me again. We talked more and more, and got everything out. It was almost 9.30 when we were done. The first two hours was about our past, but the final hour was mostly a friendly conversation. We didn't talk again that week. This week, one day he approached me during lunchtime, and we had a short chat about random things. Today, he asked to see me again after work. We had a short chat, and he brought up the letter again. Told me that he had time to think about everything. He said that he wasn't convinced that I was changed back then, but now after two weeks, he's seen me around, and he thinks that I might have. He told me that he's willing to forgive me and put the past behind us, and we shook hands as friends. Oh, and at the end, he said that I owe him a lifetime of favors. <laughs> I do. I've never been happier in my life, and I can't stop crying. In the comments, three cheers for both of you for being grown-ups and shedding baggage from your past. I agree. If anything speaks to the trauma of bullying, it's his reaction when he saw her again. I'm so happy for him. This resolution hopefully brings him some healing. Good job, OP, on the letter, and taking responsibility and initiative, and not making it about you. I'm sure this was life-changing for you as well. Apologies don't make everything right again, but since we can't go back in time, they are the best that we can do. This is a good one. It's always good to see someone move forward being a better person. They really can help, though. One of my biggest bullies apologized years later. He didn't even say the words I'm sorry, and he didn't need to, because the message was very clearly sincere regret for having harmed me, and he felt like a huge asshole for having bullied me, and others, for so long. And what made it so sincere is what a lot of people would condemn as an excuse. He said he bullied people to direct negative attention away from his obesity to other targets, followed by saying he wishes he could go back in time and knock some sense into his younger self. He wasn't making an excuse for his behavior. He was saying, you didn't deserve that. It was all because of what a shitty person I was. 
I think that's the difference between making an excuse and a real apology. He wasn't seeking forgiveness, he was trying to reverse the hurt by saying he was the real problem. In any case, it actually did make me feel a whole lot better, and 15 years had gone by at that point. That poor kid. I wish people who were bullies could explain why they did it and what could have made them stop. Sometimes kids are acting out of their own trauma and powerlessness at home, but so many are like OP, with excellent lives who just like the power or something. It's like an eternal terror generation after generation, and it can destroy their victims' lives. But we accept it as just part of being a kid? How the hell do you stop that? There's a part of me that still wants to ask my bully why he did it for 10 years from age 6. Like, you just woke up one day and decided you extremely hated someone you never even talked to? Was that decade for him worth my decade of fear, anxiety, depression, and anger? OP sounds genuinely sorry for it, but they're lucky that he could forgive her. There needs to be a better system of dealing with bullies and helping their victims. I mean, when kids in school do it, it's called bullying, but if family does that, it's called abuse.